I have introduced uh, Professor Sintanshu Yashashandra because he's the chief guest today, but he will be giving his keynote address or inaugural address and his comments after listening to both the creative writer as well as the translator. I would like to introduce Dalpar Bhai Chauhan, who will be talking about his book, Malak. Dalpar Bhai Chauhan has played a pioneering role in the publication and propagation of Gujarati Dalit literature. He is founder member of several Dalit literary associations in Gujarat and has edited and published magazines such as Akrosh, Howlet Reed, and Kalo Suraj, Laksan, Malak, Omen. His first novel was published in 1991, and since then he has published four more novels, the latest being Papu, Afternoon, in 2021. He also has collections of poetry, short stories, plays, essays on Dalit writing, and the dictionary of Dalit dialects to his credit. His writing challenges upper caste hegemony and draws attention to the continuing oppression and exploitation of Dalits. Dalpat Bhai is a five time recipient of the Gujarati Savitri Academy Literature Award and has also received several other awards, including Dunketo. His novels, poetry, and short stories have been translated into Hindi, Marathi, and English. His novels and poems have been prescribed at universities in India and abroad. I would like to add personally by me in certain universities in Germany in translation and I also had a few students of mine from Avignon and Bordeaux who translated his work. Here I would like to share something because it was a very edifying experience when one translated his work because I had called him from Germany because there is something to do with the morning sun and the afternoon sun and him not wanting the afternoon sun at all but wanting the morning and the evening sun. Stupid that I am, I was turning around and wondering why is he talking about it. Morning sun is most lubrious, maybe perhaps. Then he corrected and told me, you've forgotten something, my dear young friend. We were not allowed outside. And it is to do with the shadows we stretched in front of us in the morning and the shadows which we left behind in the evening. And that was one of the reasons. Thank you very much, Dalpat Bhai, for that very interesting information, which also changed me to a considerable extent. Learn, I unlearned myself and myself. Hopefully, I'm a better person today because of my knowing you. On that note, I would invite you to deliver your talk. इस सभा के मैं हिंदी में बोलूँगा अंग्रेजी में इतना नहीं बोल सकता गुजराती से मैं तो आप लोगों को नहीं बोल सकता समझ में नहीं आएगा आपसे पूछूँगी इस सभा के सभापति की सभापति महोदय पीएम कविराज प्रोफेसर सिद्धर राजेश्वरन जी अतिथि विशेष एवं पुस्तक विमोचन करता गुजराती के मोर्धनी कवि नाट्यकार पदंत्री डॉक्टर सिद्धांशु यशचंद्र जी जिन्होंने मुझे अंग्रेजी भाषा में पहचान दिलाई वैसे विदुषी प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर निरूपर बरुचा जी और आप सबका तहे दिल से अभिनंदन करता हूँ धन्यवाद करता हूँ सुनसोद फिरते दिन को तो मैं भूल नहीं सकता प्रोफेसर क्लाउस स्टोफर भी उनका भी मैं बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद करता हूं मैं अपने इस उपन्यास के बारे में कहूं तो क्या कहूं ये स्वयं मेरा बयान नहीं है मेरा ये उपन्यास मेरा बयान नहीं है यह उपन्यास मेरे पुरखों के आंसुओं का बोध हो रहा है मेरे पुरखों ने अपना वतन हो ऐसी इच्छाएं पाल रखी थी वे भी गाना चाहते थे है मेरे प्यारे वतन तुझ पे दिल कुर्बान किंतु वह दिन कभी नहीं आया 
उन्होंने जहां भी पैर जमाए जड़ से उखाड़ दिए गए कभी रोजी रोटी ने उखाड़ा कभी दाना पानी उठ गया पर सबसे ज्यादा परेशान किया इस सवर्ण समाज ने कभी अस्पृश्यता के नाम पर कभी धर्म के नाम पर जिलावतन होना या हिजरत करना बड़ा दुखदा ही होता है उसमें पूरा समाज तीतर बीतर हो जाता है बिखर जाता है तर बतर भटकना पड़ता है ना साथ मिलता है ना सहारा यहां से भागते रहो भागते रहो उनसे कहीं पांव रुक जाते तो हंसी आ जाती लगता ये स्थान हमें कितना समय आसरा देगा कब तेरा तंग उठाना पड़ेगा वे नहीं जानते थे हमारा जीना तो अत्याचारियों के अत्याचारियों पर निर्भर था अंग्रेजों के गुलाम राजाओं की गुलाम प्रजा पर हम निर्भर था वे हमें हिजरत के लिए या कहो स्थानांतर के लिए मजबूर करते थे और हमारे हटने से हमारे सारे निशान समय निकल जाता था कोई खंडहर नहीं बचता मस्ती का नाम और निशान मिट जाते हैं जैसे पानी से उंगली बाहर निकाली और जगह भर गई ये उपन्यास हमारी पीडम बनाए व्यथाएं एवं अपमानों का पहाड़ है इसे दूर से ना देखो जरा नजदीक आओ नजरों से छुओ समझो हृदय को सहानुभूत से हृदय को सहानुभूत के सब जल से प्लावित कर दो तभी तो हमारा यथार्थ आप पाओगे सत्य पाओगे हमारा गीता कल अतीत समझोगे साहित्य में यथार्थ के साथ दो दो हाथ करना आसान नहीं है और हमारा अतीत जुटलाया नहीं जाता वो कल भी था आज भी है और आने वाले कल को भी वो घेर कर बैठा है इसलिए इसलिए तो मैं लिखता हूँ दोहराता हूँ और कहना चाहता हूँ आने वाले कल से सावध रहो सावधान रहो चौकन्ने रहो आज मैं ये सवाल समाज से पूछना चाहता हूँ कि इतनी सारी कानूनी बंदिशों के बावजूद ये अछूतपन जैसी सामाजिक बुराई समाप्त हुई है क्या संस्कारों में पीढ़ी दर पीढ़ी बोली गई इस घृणा से समाज मुक्त हुआ है क्या और एक और सवाल भी पूछ लें जिस पर मुलक या होमलैंड उपन्यास फोकस करता है वह है स्थानांतरण हिजरत अपनी भूमि छोड़कर अपना गांव बस्ती छोड़कर कहीं और जाके सिर छुपाना और कहने की जरूरत नहीं है कि हमारे वर्तमान की भी यही समस्या है दलित हिजरत करते हैं स्थानांतरण करते हैं और ये समस्या आज भी दूर नहीं गई भारत में समस्याएं हर समय करवट बदलती हैं, बहाने बनाती हैं, आग लगाती हैं, बस्तियां उजाड़ती हैं, दलित बस्ती को मिट्टी के ढेर में बदल देती है मेरा यह उपन्यास सवर्ण स्त्री संतोष और दलित पुरुष भगा के अवैध संबंधों की कथा है अवैध संबंध तो एक बहाना है एक व्यक्ति के गुना का बोझ सारा दलित समाज भुगतता है और उपन्यास में दलितों पर हुए अत्याचारों की परतें खुलती जाती है मैं अपने बचपन की एक छोटी सी घटना सुनाना चाहता हूँ बचपन में मैंने अचानक एक दिन अपने आप को नम दरम हालत में पानी की भीख मांगते मांगते पाया मेरे हाथ में मिट्टी का खाली लोटा था दूसरे हाथ में माँ की उंगली हमसे एक हाथ दूर खड़ी कोई स्त्री रस्सी बंदे अपने घड़े से मेरे खाली लोटल में पानी डाल रही थी बड़ी सावधानी से 
कहीं उसका गड़ा हमें छू न जाए वह स्त्री कौन थी नहीं जानता सामने एक गांव का कुआं था दूर बरगद का पेड़ था पूरब में सूरज हाजिर था वहां के सिर पर पानी से भरा मटका था मैं कभी पानी की धार को देखता कभी मां के चेहरे को पानी की उछलती बूंदे मुझे कंपित कर रही थी मैं यह चीज कभी नहीं भूला उसने मुझे बरसों तक सताया है झपचो रहा है मैंने जिंदगी के 45-40 साल बाद इस घटना को भोलक की प्रस्तावनाओं में उकेरा ये कंपन मुझे दलित साहित्य के कई मोड़ पर ले गए मैंने दलित साहित्य की हर विधा में लिखा कविता कहानी उपन्यास नाटक एकांकी सप्तकोश प्रवास निबंध आलोचना पर एक चीज मैंने ध्यान में रखी मैं कभी दलित यथार्थ से दूर नहीं गया मेरी कलम के अक्षरपन ने मेरे अपने विडम्बनाए व्यथाए अपमान अवमानना हिंकार अत्याचार के साथ हमारे भोलेपन दिलेरी सुख दुख सबको के रहा है हाँ तो आज भी नहीं बदला जस का तस वही पुराना मेरा पहला उपन्यास मुलक या होमलैंड यह बात दोहराता है इस उपन्यास के चरित्रों के कई अनुज आज भी जिंदा होंगे जरूर जिंदा होंगे और आज के अत्याचार झेलने वालों की तो कोई कमी नहीं भारत बड़ा अजीब देश है उसे उसमें आज भी दलित मोहल्ले जलाए जाते हैं दलित स्त्रियों पर बलात्कार होते हैं वर राजा घोड़े पर सवारी वर राजा घोड़े पर सवारी निकाले तो उसकी अर्थी उठ जाती है पूछे रखी मार दिया गया मंदिर में दर्शन करने गए तो मौत मिली मेरा उपन्यास सौ साल पहले की कहानी सुनाता है पर यह कथा आज से कहीं जरा भी दूर नहीं गई और आखिर में प्रोफेसर नीलूफर जी ने हमारी कथाओं को अंग्रेजी में जगह दिला कर हम पर बहुत बहुत उपकार किया है जब तक उपन्यास रहेगा तब तक नीलूफर जी हमारे साथ रहेगी ऐसे साथ देने वालों को मैं बहुत बहुत अभिनंदन करता हूँ आप सबका भी अभिनंदन करता हूँ धन्यवाद करता हूँ आखिर में एक बात कहू कि समाज थोड़ा बदला है पहले हमें दूर से गंदा फेंक कर मारा करते थे पर आज हाथ पकड़ कर मारते हैं धन्यवाद I would like to introduce the translator, Professor. I would like to introduce the translator. Actually, my apologies, I goofed up a little bit. If you look at the schedule, it's the other way round. Professor Dr. Nilufari Balucha is co-director of the Mumbai Munster Institute of Advanced Studies, formerly Kohat Indian Diaspora Center, University of Mumbai. He is a visiting professor at the West Fadish Wilhelm's University of Munster, Germany. She was on the Global Virtual Faculty of the Fadley Dickinson University, USA, and is faculty associate emeritus, South Asian Studies Institute, University of the Fraser Valley, Canada. She was former head and senior professor at Department of English, University of Mumbai. Her current research interests are focused on literature and cinema of the Indian diaspora, law and literature, and writing of the Parsis. She has published widely in these areas in India and abroad, and is co-editor of the Diaspora Studies series, a publication of the Cohab IDC MMIS, University of Mumbai, in which a few volumes have already come out. She has been a visiting professor at many universities in Europe, USA, and Canada. She was the coordinator and scientist in charge of the European Union's Marie Curie International Project on Diaspora, which had seven universities, which had Munster as its flagship, then Oxford, Stockholm, and a number of other universities. She has received several professional awards, such as the British Council Scholarship for Studies, Commonwealth Academic Fellowship. 
postdoctoral research at the Queen Mary and Westfield College. That professor, ICCR. Okay, if you're so embarrassed, many books, many MOUs, many publications, many keynotes, many talks, most importantly, forged bonds with so many people who are here today from different universities. On that note, Professor Nilofar Barucha, who is also a creative writer and has published several short stories, I would like you to give your translator's response to Dr. Pais Malakhan. Thank you, Sridhar, uh, Professor Sridhar. At the outset, I would like to say that it is I who have been honored to have been asked by you to translate your first novel, Mother, not the other way around. Okay, so that should be absolutely clear. It's an honor, honor to me to translate uh, Dr. Pai's work. And after listening to him, you will realize that even if you haven't read anything in Gujarati by Dalpan Bhai, the passion with which he writes, the sincerity, and uh, this, this was very, very difficult for me when I started translating the book, and it was a great responsibility to be able to translate, uh, not just linguistically, but even emotionally and ideologically, and intellectually, all that Dalpatpai wanted to say and has said, not just in Malak, his first novel, but his subsequent works. And he has been very prolific, as you see from the introduction that Sridhar has given. And uh, let, me, let me just tell you that, uh, uh, I mean, he has spoken to us about Malak, that it was uh, first published uh, uh, the Science Academy has published this translation at the end of last year, and uh, being his first novel, it was published in 1991. But actually, it was serialized in a Gujarati magazine between 1987 and 1988. So it's been a long time. But as he has said, the contemporary situation, unfortunately, sadly, is not all that different from what he has depicted and the setting of his novel is even further back in time, as he says, even a hundred years back. Uh, it's a very powerful Dalit narrative and uh, what, what drew me to it was not just Dalpatpai's persuasiveness and the passion with which he speaks, but also the fact that uh, this is still relevant to us in contemporary times. And when he approach me for this translation. At first I was very hesitant. I was very, very hesitant. And he did a lot of persuasion, but I was very hesitant. I had translated some of his poems already by then, and they had been published in journals uh, abroad. And I had even taught, like Sridhar, I had taught Dalpar Pai's poems at seminars in uh, various German universities. But translating Malak, was a big challenge and I did not know uh, whether I was capable of taking up this challenge. But then I read and reread and reread the novel. It's a slim novel. Thank you, Dr. Bhai, for not writing tomes, I think it's. So it, uh, I reread it several times and the, uh, it's set in rural northern Gujarat in pre-independence India, as he has already said to you. And the setting and the characters were in the beginning rather alien to me, very, very alien, the setting as well as the characters. But then as I read and reread and reread, as I said, they began to become familiar. The Santok and his Baga and all of them were like people I knew. They became very familiar. And I felt I had to engage with their stories, their lives. Now, as you might know, many of you would know, I'm a very urban person, all right? I'm a Bombay girl, all right? And I'm not just a Bombay girl, Mumbai, Mumbai girl, if you want to say that, but a Parsi woman educated through the English medium and have lived all my life in Mumbai. But my primary schooling was done at a Parsi school, a school run by Parsis where I was very few of them in existence now, 
where I was taught the Gujarati language. So I can read and write Gujarati. And as a Parsi, Gujarati is also my mother tongue. And I spoke it at home with my parents and older relatives, with the siblings like my sibling here. Uh, we would generally speak to one another in uh, English, but with the parents and aunts and uncles and cousins. Not that they didn't know English, but it's just generally ex expected that we would speak to one another in Gujarati. Uh, but of course, this was the Parsi dialect of Gujarati. Okay, it was not a formal standard Gujarati. And my acquaintance with standard formal Gujarati is thanks to the 11 years that I spent as a lecturer in English at the Manibel Nanavati Women's College, a Gujarati medium college in Vilepadre, affiliated to the SNDT Women's University. And I have a very old colleague from there who is also going to present a paper, Dr. Pranya Shukla. My spoken Gujarati improved dramatically during those uh, days that I spent at the Manipen Nanavati College. And it was thanks to colleagues like Dr. Pranya Shukla, to the poet, the head of the Gujarati department, Dr. Nitin Mehta, who later joined the Bombay University as the head of the Gujarati department here. Nitin Bhai became a great friend, like Pranya. We were all young lecturers together and we bonded. And uh, Nitin Bhai and his friends, Arun Adalja, Pramod Parekhua, names, and uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, Adalja has passed away, so Pramod Parekh is very much around. And to single out just a few of Nitin Bhai's uh, friends, Gujarati literatures, who visited the college regularly, and I gained a lot from my interactions with them. Sitanju Bhai too was an unknown to us because his wife Anjani Pen was our colleague. And above all, there was the great uh, uh, father figure of Sundarji Betai, who was like a mentor to the college, Gujarati poet, critic, translator. And I remember the many literary conversations that we young women like Pragnya and me along with Nitin Bhai of course we used to have these conversations with Betaiji as we sat together in our common room over innumerable cups of tea. This, this all is my background. You wonder what this woman is doing translating a novel like Malak. It is against this personal background that I finally agree to translate Malak which tells the tale a group of Dalits who eked out an existence on the margins of an upper caste village. I think Dalpadva has spoken about this, but in Hindi, and we have an international audience who might not have really understood what he was saying. So bear with me while I talk to you about this. They belong to the Vankar caste and were considered untouchables by the upper caste villagers. This, of course, was a uh, eye-opener for me because as a Mumbai girl, I had also read Namdev Dasal and the Marathi poets and they, they were all mainly from the Mahar caste and uh, their, their poetry was in a sense very different from what I found in uh, Dalpatbhai's writing and the Vankar caste was for me, it was something new, I didn't know that they were also considered, I mean my ignorance, they were also considered to be untouchables. Uh, so they were also considered to be untouchables by the upper caste villagers. Many of these men had taken loans from, small loans from, uh, and their forefathers had taken these loans from the village landlords, and they were bonded to them for generations. This is an unfortunate uh, bonded laborer situation which exists throughout India and not just among the uh, lower castes. And uh, as a result, they had to provide free labor to the landlord. And this, this takes up a lot of uh, space in, in Malak, which uh, the title has been translated as homeland. The sole idea of giving free labor, that they were forced to give free labor. And that, is, that comes right at the beginning of the novel and right till the end, this whole idea of bonded labor. The women of these, uh, this group in the village were sexually harassed 
and at times raped and murdered, as uh, Dalpat Bhai has said. The men were brutally beaten, sometimes killed for crimes real and imagined. They were denied access to common drinking water. I had tears in my eyes when Dalpat Bhai was talking about his own childhood experiences. Uh, they were denied access to common drinking water sources. Of course, they were not allowed into the temples, and there are great many uh, sections in the novel where uh, the protagonists, some of the, it's, it's an ensemble class, so some of the protagonists are standing outside the temple and taking the darshan of the deity inside, and that too was not allowed to them. They were driven away even from, they were brutally beaten up even for that. Uh, as Dalpat Bhai has already said, at their weddings, they were not even allowed to seat their rooms on horses, as it was seen as a challenge to the uh, power and prestige of the upper caste. Yet these Vankas, attachment to the land where they lived and labored under such oppressive conditions, is very real. That this love for the homeland is very real. This is their Malak, their homeland. So when they are driven out of their quarters and forced to leave their homeland over a sexual scandal involving a Dalit young man and the daughter-in-law of the village landlord, they suffer the trauma that results from leaving the land where they and their ancestors had been born, lived, loved, suffered, and even died. And as I said, this novel is a very powerful ensemble cast. Uh, and their dark stories, which I have often discussed with Albert Bhai, the stories are very dark, very sad, very tragic. But at the same time, there's a lot of romance, there's a lot of laughter. They are young people, they go to the mela, to the fair, they flirt with one another, and they exchange little clandestine gifts. And there are even comic interviews like the young man who was not allowed to sit on a horse, so they hired a camel for him to sit on the camel. But that finally became a tragic issue. But uh, there are there are very comic interviews as well. And uh, Dalpur Sai has written his novel in what I would term a post-colonial narrative style. Much before post-colonialism became a fashionable kind of narrative as far as uh, Indian English writers were concerned. And there are interior monologues, many, many interior monologues in the novel. There are interventions of the past into the present, and uh, this, this gives the novel a very contemporary edge. I, I just felt that it was very contemporary. And uh, even the language is a judicious mix of northern Gujarat rural dialect, very, very difficult for me to understand, uh, and standard Gujarati. Also, in spite of the exploitative and brutal uh, uh, events in the novel, the novel does not lack beauty and even melody. At times, it's very melodious. It's very melodious, the novel. And the anger of the Vankars against their oppressors is meant into abuses. It was again very difficult to translate abuses. The very inventive abuses are there. Dalpat Bhai has a whole repertoire of very inventive abuses. And uh, but they mumble them under their breath because as uh, the bonded labor, they can't speak it aloud. So this harshness is set off by lyrical passages which describe nature and the sadness of loss, personal loss, not just the loss of the homeland, experienced by the different protagonists in the novel. And uh, while I attempted to be faithful to the style of the author, a word-by-word -word translation is avoided. The author's style of short sentences, he writes in very short, at least Malak has been written mainly in very short sentences, except for the melodious sections which are longer sentences. And I have retained the short sentences so that there is a, that gives the novel a kind of staccato effect. And uh, it's very abrupt, with abrupt sudden changes. So this just mirrors the language itself, is language mirror these sudden abrupt changes in their lives. And I've tried to retain that. 
It has not, of course, been possible to translate the northern Gujarat dialect into a rural English dialect. I couldn't bring in a hardy type of Wessex dialect or something into this novel. It would not suit the bill. Standard English that has a pan-Indian reach has been used instead throughout the translation. Apart from authenticity, what is also at stake in any translation is the readability factor in the target language. So that was my major concern too. And uh, Malak has already been translated into several Indian languages. This is the first time that it has been translated into English. And I've read some of those uh, Hindi translations of Malak. And I felt that it was so much easier for the Hindi translator to translate it because she had the rural Hindi dialects, Dalit Hindi dialects to fall back upon and put into the novel. It really facilitated that uh, translation for them. But what helped me was discussions with friends, students, and colleagues on issues related to the Vankar dialect and the situation of this community in Gujarat. Nalpatna later on, later on came up with a dictionary of this dialect, and that was a great help. Heartfelt gratitude to all who have helped me in this process. There is Dr. Rakhilal Rohit, who is here. I had many long discussions with him. There is Dr. Pragnya Shukla, who has helped me a lot. There is uh, one of Shridhar's PhD students, Dr. Kruti Vyas, who has helped me a lot. So a lot of thanks to them, of course. Uh, any lacuna, if any, is my responsibility, not theirs. I also am very thankful to Professor Sanjukta Das and Professor Anu Surema, whose encouragement and support enabled it to be published by Sahitya Academy. At the Sahitya Academy, I'm grateful to Mr. Jyoti Krishna Varma and all of those who have been connected with the publication and production of this book. For me, Kalpatbhai, this uh, translation has been a labor of love and has taken years. I've taken a very, very long time in doing it. And, but I'm very glad that I did it. And I hope that the readers find it, find reading it, as much like reading it as much as I liked translating it. Thank you. I now have the honor of inviting the chief guest, Professor Sitan Shu, Assistant Chandra, to give a few of the letters. electronically. I'm very glad and grateful for this invitation to Professor Jennifer Karacha. I'm struck above all by a fact that a pioneering novel by an author coming from a community which has been on forced move. And this has been translated by a person 
who also comes from a community which some years, some centuries back was on a similar, probably more <coughs> final displacement from one place to another. So what is the meaning of this meeting of an author of four <coughs> displacement experiences by a translator who has similar experience and both share from the margins a standard language to which I belong. So what is the meaning of this configuration? To me it means that while it is important, crucial for a standard language, be it standard Gujarati or standard English, and the culture that that standard language represents, the central culture. Two things are important. One, to pay full attention to these uh, forced displacements and to look as two of my most distinguished Dalit writers, friends in Gujarati, have done. Dampat Chawan, not only in this novel, but later on, and we'll come to that in a moment. And Nero Patel in his poems. And there are several others who follow this novelist poet and Nero Bhai, amongst Dalit writers, who have furthered this journey. But this translation and the translator also reminds me and should remind the standard language people that the periphery of a standard language is a large periphery. And the periphery of a society is also a large periphery. So the first point I am making is this. It is crucial that Dalit writers especially like Dapad Bhai and Nero Bhai. They present to us not only documents, not only autobiographies, but as Dapad Bhai has brilliantly pointed out, the narrative of a whole people. Crucial, equally crucial is, I believe, now in the times to come, a conversation amongst variously display, displaced, variously tortured, and variously fighting back. Peripheries of the standard languages and the standard culture. My first celebration is that Malak has blazed a trail and has led Gujarati literature beyond Padalal Patel. The dialect literature. In fact, Padalal Patel's society, the Patel's, the farmers, are now in this novel the cause of another problem. The Dalits, they enter into greatest conflict with the farmers and the Brahmins. <laughs> Dalpatpa has a generosity and sharpness of a major author. Sharpness, the sharpness with which he presents Malak and later on moves from a village to a Kasba town, Kasba town to a city, and now he will move to the megapolis, I'm sure. Because he cannot be stopped. But equally, 
the generosity of the author. And this is a problem that I find. Very often, the sharpness of a protesting author lacks in generosity, at least in recognizing other similar peripheral regions. So this is my first hope that one of the novels or a poem by the Bhai who speak of other atrocities, non-Dalit atrocities. I met Shinua Ashebik in Berlin several decades back and he knew Gujarati. He could listen to Gujarati, he could speak because he lived amongst the Gujaratis in his own so I asked him and he was very kind to me. He gave me a signed uh, copy of his terminology. So I said, I am a Gujarati and you have been harassed by Gujaratis in Nigeria, in Africa because Gujaratis were not very kind to the merchants and they secured, they tried to secure favor from the ruling class. So I said, he said, you don't know one thing that I know. I said, what? The Gujaratis might have, the merchants might have harassed us, but I know first hand how many they were are harassed by others, and Gandhi wrote about it. That's what Shino Ashavi wrote. This is the difference <laughs> between a writer of commitment who has sharp edge and a great writer who has compassion for all. I had read Malak of course several times like all of us when it was published at least once or twice and extensively I read it for a week before I showed it to you I read it. I usually refrain from uh, this kind of showing of uh, books because those who you know, tear the uh, cover they see the book for the first time and the last time. <laughs> but I had read it several times. But Nilufarji's, and I'm using this word quite seriously, magic of translation. Magic in the sense that things that translate, the shifting of expression from one culturally embedded language into another culturally embedded language is an extremely difficult. Because other culture which embeds English language is very different from the dialects of. So I, like a good teacher, started from the title. I said Mala. So what does Rizufa Gurucha, what she does Balak? Because I suspected that she would not know exactly what is Balak. But I was wrong. Because even on the Parsi periphery, there are people who know the standard language as much as those who are in the center. And the proof of that is in the title Malak. Because what is Malak? How does Malak? How did Malak word come to Gujarati, standard Gujarati? Now Malak comes from Mulk. And Mulk is a Persian Arabic language word. And it brings in all the associations of conquest. So Mulk is related to political power and to oppression of Gujarat. Al Mulk, something of Al Mulk, they are the lords of that Mulk. And Gujarat then becomes a Mulk. So, how started? The Bhai chooses the word Malak. So let me see how inside the novel, how is that word used? So this is the last sentence of the novel. 
Rulers came from outside, and they became ruled, which is also a major experience of Gujarat. And sh it should not be just brushed away. But how does a Dalit writer, a Vankar writer, how does he use this word? First, Mulk, the Tatsama, is turned into a Tatbhava. Bulak. And when that summer turns into a Tadda, whether in Marathi or Gujarati or any Bengali, any language, you pay attention. You listen to this people making it Tadda or Abhapranishad or whatever, Desh, whatever. So, I ask myself, why does this author use the word, why doesn't he use the word like Desh? which is also a very common word. Desma Gyata. In Savarashati, Desma Gyata means they, they went, they, even when they are in Adabad, right there in Gujarat, or when they are in Delhi, right there in India, Desh is something in Ajgama. So that, and Desi Vad was, is also so popular, so I, I, I find it shallow. But he didn't uh, use the word Desh. The, the, no, nowhere in this novel, the Desh has been used. Or Vatan has been used once or twice, but not Vatan. Vatan is also, of course, uh, realized. So, and so, what is Malak for uh, the people who have been thrown out of Malak? And as this powerful of success, they have been thrown out of Malak, but they will go to Malak. This is to my mind, the greatness of this writer. But what makes him a major writer? In a sense, that Malak has been used in two ways. You have been thrown out of your Malak, and I must find out that lovely last sentence of the novel. Amakai vaad jo bhi nahi, lo hendo gada ay utho. ભાવ <laughs> 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 જરા ગુજરાતી માં બોલું દુઃખ પડે ને ત્યારે રોતલ વેડા તો બધા કરે એને કે લેખક કેવા એને કે સર્જક કેવા પણ હી ઇઝ અ મેન હુ શેડ્સ નો ટીયર્સ ઇઝ ઓન ધી એન્ગર ઇન હિઝ આઈસ આઈ એમ શ્યોર ધેટ એન્ગર વિલ ટર્ન ઇનટુ અ મચ ગ્રેટર કમ્પેશન આઈ એમ વેટિંગ ફોર ધેટ ઇટ ઇઝ નોટ હેપન હિયર not even daya baba not even namdev tasa i hope that a young dalit writer who look at the compassion it has in the pain of india pain of all people there is so much pain there is so much mutual mourning so some novel will come but this will this has placed a train and there are other novels in which now what happens when our parsi translator translates this into english she is bilingual parsi bilingual and professor of english and knows english like you know, international english and indian english every english so the english is of various so what has she done so malak as we read This land, our country, our whatever region, 
No. She has added one word, homeland. And that's exactly what this means. That Malak definitely left behind is home. And Malak which is now, the Dalits will create their own Malak. It will almost be like a conquest, not a home. I hope it doesn't become a conquest kind of situation. I hope it becomes only an expansion-like situation. But I don't rule out the other possibility. Because there are so many countries, and I'll come to that issue a little, a little two, three minutes. Are the Dalits being led to conquest? Or are the Dalit writers and Dalit community being led to compassion? Much greater compassion. Compassion of the great people, compassion of the great writers. Of the great writers. This is my question. And Nilifar Baruja has honed in on this word homeland. Because Malak described here is a home. They are displaced from the home. That is the problem. But they are strong people. And the, this man is their strong fellow. So he says, okay, we'll create a new Malak. But the home is lost. And that loss is the theme of this novel. But that theme has not been underlined in the original title. But this great translator has somehow intuited, like a good Parsi, whose home is forever lost, but who has created a home in Gujarat. So much contribution from Dalabai Nabroji and Yamshiji Tata. All the so this word has come to her because this is a community which has learned how to make a new home and not only your own home but home where everybody is invited. The Parsi in our city, the Parsi friendship, the Parsi laughter. And I think that is a great contribution as a translator. I would like to uh, in concluding five minutes. So, who is the publisher? I think that is a crucial question we must ask ourselves. The publisher of this is Sahit Academy, our own academy, run by Sahit, Sahit by literary, by, by writers, so far. Now, so what is translation? And what is publication? And who is the publisher? Because at one end, I see how noted here four types of translations. And one is Translation as a zoo. English speaking people want a zoo in English language, which they could visit and watch and say, oh, what kind of animals are these? So translation as a zoo explores other cultures as exotica. I'm very really glad that the first novel, first translation is by Science Academy of India. I'm deeply suspicious of international publishers. I watch very closely which books they choose for translation. And my suspicion does not decrease. So, this Indian life and its pain, all its pains and disasters. Are they a zoo story for the Western culture? And what kind of books are these international publishers promoting? And why are they promoting? We must ask that question. Second type of translation 
is translation of an expansion of a own literary culture, literary and cultural conversation. The Buddha is doing exactly that. From Gordana to Munshi to Darsha to Panala to Dalpa. This is an expansion. And we are waiting for the next one. Translation could be a stimuli, not an expect not an expansion, but a break. But the Bible does both the things. And that is the magic. Sometimes, you know, it is awesome. What's a kind of how shall I say? The knife and separates. I said, go. You should listen to him when he's angry. <laughs> and he uses the service knife. This is a fellow which is not angry. But he has compassion. And so, it is also a break and an expansion. You will be surprised what Jagannath. Panditra Jagannath, how he defines literary language. He says, Puna Puna Anusandhana Maka Gnana Bhavana Gnana. He says, Puna Puna Anusandhana. That means you connect and disconnect. You connect and disconnect. Puna Puna Anusandhana. That's what he is doing. He will take me to task if I tell him that you are expanding. Panditra Jagannath's poetry. <laughs> but that's not how he perceives himself. But I perceive his work as a continuity of Panditra Jagannath. He was also a great rebel. Panditra Jagannath was not connected to Pandit in the ordinary sense. But about that, we will suck in some other. Uh, and fourth translation is to make you see what you would like to see. And that is, the, and I conclude my presentation with that. It makes you see what you don't want to see. And there is a great defense mechanism in every culture. You don't want to see. But how do you show that? In a film, a Jewish man is held by his neck by Nazi officers and brought to the women's section of the torture land. He says, see, see, look, look, look. And his wife is being kind of polished. Impossible to see that. So literature and the arts are the only way a whole people, a whole culture learns how to see what is too painful. Dalit, some of my Dalit friends they also don't want to see the other pains because there's so much pain already there's no more room for bearing more pain it's so human but then literature is not human. It is something more than human. And I think what an unusually perceptive Parsi translator's title and the whole book also I've read several times. We'll have a session, two hour session, for this some other day, but uh, you know, comparing the two. But capacity. Books like this and translations like this should enhance our capacity to bear pain. And as Darsi Mehta has said, Vaishnava Janto, Vaishnava Janto, don't forget that to. Not this, but this. Ane nai, ane. Vaishnava Janto, tene re Je, peed parai, jane. Now, look at the word, jhāne that's how you can begin, not by experiencing, but by knowing. In fact, how can I say that after reading Malak, I have experienced the pain 
of the Dalits. I've not experienced it. I've just known it, which is the first thing. Janet, Paradukhe Uttad. Associate yourself with somebody else's book. Paradukhe he wants us. That, so with this, that we must, all of us, we must know each other's pains, each other's devastations. First of all, know and do something about it. And don't become a great writer <laughs> who has the license to write about everybody's pain. But in an humbleness uh, attempt to describe so you see, you go on from now to now. Most grateful to you, sir, for uh, letting me associate you and Madam for that. Thank you. Request. Can you please, sir, ask which parent you have in all this? Ask your husband, sir. Of 
my mother came from Dilimora, a town in South Punjab, it was a village, then it became a town. And uh, she and her sisters, and especially with their mother, they used to speak in the kind of a rural dialect. And Dehiro and things like that, instead of Desi Jao, Dehi Jao and things like that. So that I said, oh my God, this is the way my mother used to speak with her elders. So uh, that, that helped me <laughs> by understanding the dialect, which was otherwise very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Dalbat Bhai, Professor uh, Sitanshu Deshishtandra, the translator here, beautiful Bhagavacha. I think uh, um, it's not necessary for me to comment anymore by virtue of the fact that they have been quite lucid and it will be more interesting to close this entire session on a very high note. Thank you very much. With that, I think the session is going in. Uh, we are running a little late, thanks to the technical glitch at the beginning of the session. But tea is uh, served outside on the lawn, so if you will join us. We make up during the lunch time, because it's a fun hour, we can have a 45 minutes lunch break. Right, Kitty? So will you please join us outside? Thank you very much, Sita. Recording stop. Congratulations to everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, I would love to discuss this with you. I would actually be quite terrified at my moment and ask you to be the chief guest. Welcome, a very big welcome, uh, Professor Sitanshu Yashashchandra Mehta, the chief guest of the symposium today, distinguished chairpersons and speakers, my colleagues from Mumbai, other parts of India, as well as from around the world who have joined on Zoom, uh, guests and students who, are, who have joined in person or online. I welcome all of you to this hybrid international symposium on translations, bridging linguistic, social, and political divides, which the Mumbai Munster Institute of Advanced Studies, which is a collaborative institution between the universities of Mumbai and Munster in Germany, is organized by us. Now, embedded within this inaugural session of the uh, symposium is the launch of the English translation of Homeland, a Gujarati Dalit novel, Malak, uh, written in the second half of the last century by Dalpat Chauhan, who is here with us, and set in Guru India. The need to engage with the lives of that section of society, that even in the present time, has to face so many social and economic challenges is crucial, not just within India, but also at the the distinct speakers at the symposium will all be presenting keynotes as they are senior, award-winning authors and translators who will interact not just with offline and online audience, but also with one another as they share their own experiences of translating from different languages into English or other Indian and global languages. The chairperson of this session, the inaugural session, is Professor Sridhar Rajeswaran, academic critic, researcher, poet, translator, and MMI's advisory board member. But before I hand over the proceedings uh, of this session to him, let me very briefly introduce you to him. He's the director of the Center for Advanced Studies in Bush, India. He was visiting professor at IIAS Shimla and a DAAD visiting professor at the WW universities of Munster, Bonn, and Siegel, Cologne. He has been a visiting professor at other universities, both in India and abroad. He has been professor and head of the department of the faculty of the KSKV University of Kutch, 
He's also a poet and dramatist. His poems have been published in India and Britain. Uh, I, okay, I will not embarrass him anymore. But uh, before I uh, request uh, Professor Sridhar to take over the proceedings today, I will request uh, one of our young students to come forward and, yeah, one of uh, Sharmila's students can come and hand over mementos to our chief guest, to Dalpad Bhai and to Sridhar. And somebody I request should be taking photographs, please. Thank you. Thank you. First to Professor Metra. Uh, to Dalpad Bhai, please, Dalpad Bhai Chauhan. And to Professor Sridhar. We take it back from him. Go to the next slide. Okay. I now request uh, Professor Sridhar to take over the proceedings of this session. Professor Sridhar. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. We formally begin with the launch of the book. So there's a chief guest. Professor Sitanshu one project. And one There are four copies, sir. One for you, one for the creative writer, one for the transmit. Have you opened it? I had the unique job of telling people who surface on the same account. I have the honor of introducing Professor Sitanshu Yashishchandra, former Vice Chancellor of Saurashtra University. He is the recipient of Fulbright Scholarship and Ford West European Studies Fellowship. A doctorate in comparature from Indiana University and in comparative politics from Mumbai University. He has taught at MS University, Baroda, and has been a visiting professor at Sorbonne University, Paris, Pennsylvania University, Chicago University, Singapore University, Kolkata, and the list is endless. An eminent Gujarati poet, playwright, critic, and translator. There will be very few who, who work within the ambit and the larger ones it feeds into who would not know him. His creative and critical writings are available in Gujarati, English, and Hindi. He has been invited to France, Germany, USA, USSR, South Korea as a poet and critic. His awards and honors are many, and I the National Sahitya Academy Award and Saraswati Samman. Usumagraj Samman, Maharashtra, Gangadhar Maher, Rashtriya Samman, Odisha, Gujarat, Gaurav Award, and the Parmashri. He has done extensive work in translation, both in theory and practice. As president of the Gujarati Sahitya Parishad, between 2018 to 2020. He wrote a series of 36 articles presenting critically more than 25 contemporary Indian poets through Gujarati translation. His C.D. Deshmukh Memorial Lecture at India International Center explores traditional Indian understanding and practices in translation. His Gujarati adaptations of plays from many languages have been staged, staged by the Indian National Theatre and others. Well, that's the tip of the iceberg. 
and I personally feel his talk today is sufficient to alter it. Of his scholarship is many times so lovelier than what my words could assay. On that note, I have introduced uh, Professor Siddhartha Yashachandra because he's the chief guest today, but he would be giving his keynote address or inaugural address and his comments after listening to both the creator, writer, as well as the translator. I would like to introduce yes. that by Chavan will be talking about his book, Malak. Dharpad Bhai Chavan has played a pioneering role in the publication and propagation of Gujarati and the British Channel. He is founder member of several Dalit literary associations in Gujarat and has edited and published magazines such as Akrosh, Howlet Ridge, and Kalo Suraj, Laksan, Malak, Omlin. His first novel was published in 1991, and since then, he has published four more novels in Baku Afternoon in 2021. He also has collections of poetry, short stories, plays, essays on Dalit writing, and a dictionary of Dalit dialects in his credit. His writing challenges upper caste hegemony and draws attention to the country oppression and exploitation of Dalits. Dampad Bhai is a five time recipient of the Gujarati Sahitya Academy Literature Award and has also received several other awards, including Dun Ketu. His novels, poetry, and short stories have been translated into Hindi, Marathi. His novels and poems have been described at universities in India. And I would like to add personally by me in certain universities in Germany in translation. And I also had a few students of mine from Avignon and Bordeaux who translated his work. Here I would like to share something because it was a very edifying experience when one translated his work because I had called him from Germany because there is something to do with the morning sun and the afternoon sun and him not wanting the afternoon sun at all, but wanting the morning and the evening sun. Stupid that I am, I was turning around and wondering why is he talking about it? Morning sun is more salubrious, maybe perhaps. Then he corrected and told me, you've forgotten something, my dear young friend. We were not allowed outside. And it is to do with the shadows which stretched in front of us in the morning and the shadows he left behind in the evening. And that was one of the reasons. Thank you very much, Dalpat Bhai, for that very interesting information, which also changed me to a considerable extent. Learn, I unlearned myself and read Hopefully, I'm a better person today because of my knowing you. On that note, I would invite you to tell you where you talk. इस सभा के मैं हिंदी में बोलूंगा अंग्रेजी में इतना नहीं बोल सकता गुजराती में बोलूंगा तो आप लोगों को हां गुजराती में भी बहुत अच्छा अभी तो नहीं आएगा आपसे पूछ लेंगे इस सभा के सभापति श्री सभापति महोदय श्री कविराज प्रोफेसर श्रीधर राजेश्वरन जी अतिथि विशेष एवं पुस्तक विमोचन करता गुजराती के मुर्दन्य कवि नाट्यकार अध्यम श्री डॉक्टर सिद्धांशु केशव चंद्र जी जिन्होंने मुझे अंग्रेजी भाषा में पहचान दिलाई वैसे विदुषी प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर निरूपण परुचा जी और आप सबका तहे दिल से अभिनंदन करता हूँ धन्यवाद करता हूँ so that
मेरे पुरखों के आंसुओं का बोझ धो रहा है मेरे पुरखों ने अपना वतन हो ऐसी इच्छाएं पाल रखी थी ये भी गाना चाहते थे है मेरे प्यारे वतन तुझ पे दिल कुर्बान किंतु वह दिन कभी नहीं आया उन्होंने जहां भी पैर जमाए जड़ से उखाड़ दिए गए कभी रोजी रोटी भी उखाड़ा कभी दाना पानी उठ गया पर सबसे ज्यादा परेशान किया इस सवर्ण समाज ने कभी अस्पृश्यता के नाम पर कभी धर्म के नाम पर जिला वतन होना या हिजरत करना बड़ा दुखदायी होता है उसमें पूरा समाज इतर बितर हो जाता है बिखर जाता है तर बतर टकना पड़ता है ना साथ मिलता है ना सहारा यहां से भागते रहो भागते रहो दूर से कहीं पांव उठ जाते तो हंसी आ जाते लगता ये स्थान हमें इतना समय आसरा देगा कब तेरा तंबू उठाना पड़ेगा वे नहीं जानते थे हमारा जीना तो अत्याचारियों के अत्याचारियों पर निर्भर था अंग्रेजों के गुलाम राजाओं की गुलाम प्रजा पर निर्भर था वे हमें हिजरत के लिए या कहो स्थानांतर के लिए मजबूर करते थे और हमारे हटने से हमारे सारे निशान समय निकल जाता था कोई खंडहर नहीं बचता बस्ती का नामो निशान मिट जाता जैसे पानी से इंगली बाहर निकाली और जगह भर गई यह उपन्यास हमारी विडम्बनाए व्यथाए एवं अपमानों का पहाड़ है इसे दूर से ना देखो जरा नजदीक आओ नजरों से छुपो समझो हृदय को सहानी भूत से हृदय को सहानी भूत के सब जल से प्लावित कर दो तभी तो हमारा यथार्थ आप पाओगे सत्य पाओगे हमारा पिता कल सभी समझोगे साहित्य में यथार्थ के साथ दो दो हाथ करना आसान नहीं है और हमारा दुर्दया नहीं जाता वो कल भी था आज भी है और आने वाले कल को भी वो घेर कर बैठा है इसलिए इसलिए तो मैं लिखता हूँ दोहराता हूँ और कहना चाहता हूँ आने वाले कल से सावध रहो सावधान रहो चौकन में रहो आज मैं यह सवाल समाज से पूछना चाहता हूँ कि इतनी सारी कानूनी बंदिशों के बावजूद ये अछूतपन जैसी सामाजिक बुराई समाप्त तो हुई है क्या संस्कारों में पीढ़ी दर पीढ़ी बोली गई इस घृणा से समाज मुक्त हुआ है क्या और एक और सवाल ये पूछे जिस पर मुलक या होमलैंड उपन्यास फोकस करता है वह है स्थानांतरण हिजर अपनी भूमि छोड़कर अपना गांव बस्ती छोड़कर कहीं और जाके फिर छुपाना और कहने की जरूरत नहीं है कि हमारे वर्तमान की भी यही समस्या है कभी हिजरत करते हैं स्थानांतरण करते हैं और ये समस्या आज भी दूर नहीं गई है भारत में समस्याएं हर समय करवट बदलती है बहाने बनाती है आग लगाती है बस्तियां उजाड़ती है दलित बस्ती को मिट्टी के ढेर में बदल देती है मेरा यह उपन्यास सवर्ण स्त्री संतो और दलित पुरुष भगा के अवैध संबंधों की कथा है अवैध संबंध तो एक बहाना है एक व्यक्ति के गुना का बोझ सारा दलित समाज भुगत का है और उपन्यास में दलितों पर हुए अत्याचारों की परतें खुलती जाती मैं अपने बचपन की एक छोटी सी घटना सुनाना चाहता हूँ बचपन में मैंने अचानक एक दिन अपने आप को नरम गर्म हालत में 
पानी की भीख मांगते मांगते पाया मेरे हाथ में मिट्टी का खाली होता था दूसरे हाथ में माँ की उंगली हमसे एक हाथ दूर खड़ी कोई स्त्री अस्सी बंदे अपने घड़े से मेरे खाली लोटन में पानी डाल रही थी बड़ी सावधानी से कहीं उसका घड़ा हमें छू न जाए वह स्त्री कौन थी नहीं जानता सामने गांव का कुआ था दूर बरगर का पेड़ था पूरब में सूरज हाजिर था माँ के सिर पर पानी से भरा मटका था मैं कभी पानी की धार को देखता कभी माँ के चेहरे को पानी की उछलती बूंदे मुझे कंपित कर रही थी मैं यह चीज कभी नहीं भूला उसने मुझे वर्षों तक सताया है चमचो रहा है मैंने जिंदगी के पैंतालीस चालीस साल बाद इस घटना को मुलक की प्रस्तावनाओं में उकेरा ये कंपन मुझे दलित साहित्य के कई मोड़ पर ले गए मैंने दलित साहित्य की हर विधा में लिखा कविता कहानी उपन्यास नाटक एकांकी शब्दकोश प्रवास निबंध आलोचना हर एक चीज मैंने ध्यान में रखी मैं कभी दलित यथार्थ से दूर नहीं गया मेरी कलम के अक्षर पन्ने मेरे अपने बटनमनाए जन्माए अपमान अवमानना दिखता अत्याचार के साथ हमारे भोलेपन दिलेरी सुख सबको के रहा है आम तो आज भी नहीं बदला जस का दस वही पुराना मेरा पहला उपन्यास मुलक या होमलैंड यह बात दोहराता हूँ इस उपन्यास के चरित्रों के कई अनुज आज भी जिंदा होंगे जरूर जिंदा होंगे और आज के अत्याचार झेलने वालों की तो कोई कमी नहीं भारत बड़ा अजीब देश है उसे उसमें आज भी दलित मोहल्ले जलाए जाते हैं दलित स्त्रियों पर बलात्कार होते हैं वर राजा घोड़े पर सवारी वर राजा घोड़े पर सवारी निकाले तो उसकी अर्थी उठ जाती है ऊंचे रखी मार दिया गया मंदिर में दर्शन करने गए तो मौत मिलती मेरा उपन्यास सौ साल पहले की कहानी सुनाता है पर यह कथा आज से कहीं जरा भी दूर नहीं गई और आखिर में प्रोफेसर नीलूफर जी ने हमारी कथाओं को अंग्रेजी में जगह गिरा कर हम पर बहुत बहुत उपकार किया है जब तक उपन्यास रहेगा तब तक नीलूफर जी हमारे साथ रहेगी और ऐसे साथ देने वालों को मैं बहुत बहुत अभिनंदन करता हूँ आप सबका भी अभिनंदन करता हूँ धन्यवाद करता हूँ आखिर में एक बात कहूँ कि समाज थोड़ा बदला है पहले हमें दूर से दंडा फेंक कर मारा करते थे पर आज हाथ पकड़ कर मारते हैं धन्यवाद I would like to introduce the translator, sure. Professor. I would like to introduce the translator. Actually, my apologies. I goofed up a little bit. If you look at the schedule, it's the other way around. Professor Dr. Nilufari Barucha is co-director of the Mumbai Munster Institute of Advanced Studies, formerly Kohat Indian Diaspora Center, University of Mumbai. She is a visiting professor at the Westfalish Wilhelm University of Münster, Germany. She was on the global virtual faculty of the Fairleigh Dickinson University, USA, and is faculty associate at South Asian Studies Institute, University of the Fraser Valley, Canada. She was former head and senior professor at Department of English University of Mumbai. Her current research interests are focused on literature and cinema of the Indian diaspora, law and literature, and writing of the Parsis. She has published widely in these areas in India and abroad, and is co-editor of the Diaspora Studies series, a publication of the Kohab IDC MMIAS, University of Mumbai, in which a few volumes have already come out. She has been a visiting professor at many universities in Europe, USA, Canada. 
She was the coordinator and scientist in charge of the European Union's Marie Curie International Project and Diaspora, which had seven universities, which had Munster as his flagship, then Oxford, Stockholm, and I don't remember the other universities. She has received several professional awards, such as the British Council Scholarship for Studies, Commonwealth Academy Fellowship, Postdoctoral Research at the Queen Mary and Westfield College, Dad Professor of ICCR. Okay, if you're so embarrassed, many books, many MOUs, many publications, many keynotes, many talks, most importantly, forged bonds with so many people who are here today from different universities. On that note, Professor Nilufar Barucha, who is also a creative writer, and has published several short stories. I would like you to give your translator's response to that advice, Malakar. Uh, thank you, Sridhar. Uh, Professor Sridhar. At the outset, I would like to say that it is I who have been honored to have been asked by you to translate your first novel, Malak not the other way around. Okay, so that should be absolutely clear. So an honor to me to translate uh, Dr. Pai's work. And after listening to him, you will realize that even if you haven't read anything in Gujarati by Dr. Pai, the passion with which he writes, the sincerity, and uh, this, this was very, very difficult for me when I started translating the book. And it was a great responsibility to be able to translate, uh, not just linguistically, but even emotionally and ideologically and intellectually, all that Dalpatbhai wanted to say and has said, not just in Malak, his first novel, but his subsequent works. And he has been very prolific, as you have seen from the introduction that Sridhar has given. And uh, let me let me just tell you that uh, uh, I mean he has spoken to us about Malak that it was uh, first published. Uh, uh, I mean Sahitya Academy has published this translation at the end of last year, and uh, being his first novel, it was published in 1991. But actually, it was serialized in a Gujarati magazine between 1987 and 1988. So it's been a long time, but as he has said, the contemporary situation, unfortunately, sadly, is not all that different from what he has depicted and the setting of his novel is even further back in time, as he says, even a hundred years back. Uh, it's a very powerful Dalit narrative. And uh, what, what drew me to it was not just Dalpat Pai's persuasiveness and the passion with which he speaks, but also the fact that uh, this is still relevant to us in contemporary times. And when he approached me for this translation, at first I was very hesitant. I was very, very hesitant. But he did a lot of persuasion. I was very hesitant. I had translated some of his poems already by then, and they had been published in journals uh, abroad. And I had even taught, like Shridhar, I had taught Dalbert by his poems at seminars in uh, various German universities. But translating Malak was a big challenge. And I did not know whether I was capable of taking up this challenge. But when I read and reread and reread the novel, it's a slim novel. Thank you, Dalbert, for not writing poems like Higgins. So it, uh, I reread it several times, and the uh, it's set in rural northern Gujarat, in pre-independence India, as he has already said to you. And the setting and the characters were in the beginning rather alien to me, very very alien. The setting as well as the characters. But then, as I read and reread and reread, as I said. They began to become familiar. His son Tok and his Baga and all of them were like people I knew. They became very familiar. And I felt I had to engage with their stories, their lives. Now, as you might know, many of you would know, I'm a very urban person. 
all right? I'm a Bombay girl, all right? And I'm not just a Bombay girl, Mumbai, Mumbai girl, if you want to say that, but a Parsi woman educated through the English medium and have lived all my life in Mumbai. But my primary schooling was done at a Parsi school, a school run by Parsis, where I was very few of them in existence now, where I was taught the Gujarati language. So I can read and write Gujarati. And as a Parsi, Gujarati is also my mother tongue. And I spoke it at home with my parents and older relatives, with the siblings, like my sibling here. Uh, we would generally speak to one another in uh, English, but with the parents and aunts and uncles and uncles, they didn't know English, but we generally ex expected that we would speak to one another in Gujarati. Uh, but of course, this was the Parsi dialect of Gujarati. Okay, it was not a formal standard Gujarati. And my acquaintance with standard formal Gujarati is thanks to the 11 years that I spent as a lecturer in English at the Manipur Nanavati Women's College, a Gujarati medium college in Villepagle, affiliated to the SMDT Women's University. And I have a very old colleague from there who's also going to present a paper, Dr. Pratnya Shukla. My spoken Gujarati improved dramatically during those uh, days that I spent at the Manipur Nanavati College. And it was thanks to colleagues like Dr. Pragnya Shukla, to the poet, the head of the Gujarati department, Dr. Nikin Mehta, who later joined the Bombay University as the head of the Gujarati department here. Nitin Bhai became a great friend, like Pragnya. We were all young lecturers together and we bonded. And uh, Nitin Bhai and his friends, Arun Adalja, Pramod Parekhua, names in the, for, of course, uh, uh, Adalja has passed away, but Pramod Parik is very much around. And to single out just a few of Nitin Bhai's uh, friends, Gujarati literatures, who visited the college regularly, and I gained a lot from my interactions with them. Sitanshu Bhai, too, was an unknown to us because his wife, Anjani Bain, was our colleague. And of all, there was the great uh, uh, father figure of Sundarji Betai who was like a mentor to the college, Gujarati poet, critic, translator. And I remember the many literary conversations that the young women like Pragnya and me, along with Nitin Bhai, of course, we used to have these conversations with Vetaiji as we sat together in our common room over innumerable cups of tea. This, this all is my background. You wonder what this woman is doing translating a novel like Malak. It is against this personal background that I finally agreed to translate Malak, which tells the tale of a group of Dalits who eked out in existence on the margins of an upper caste village. I think Dalpadba has spoken about this, but in Hindi, and we have an international audience who might not have really understood what he was saying. So bear with me while I talk to you about this. They belong to the Vankar caste and were considered untouchables by the upper caste villagers. This of course was a, a eye opener for me because as a Mumbai girl, I had also read Namdev Darsal and the Marathi poets. And they, they were all mainly from the Mahar caste. And uh, their, their poetry was, in a sense, very different from what I found in uh, Dalpadbhai's writing. And the Vankar caste was, for me, it was something new. I didn't know that they were also considered, I and mean, my ignorance, they were also considered to be untouchables. Uh, so they were also considered to be untouchables by the upper caste villagers. Many of these men had taken loans from small loans from, uh, and their forefathers had taken these loans from the village landlords, and they were bonded to them for generations. This is an unfortunate uh, bonded laborer situation which exists throughout India and not just among the uh, lower class. And uh, as a result, they have to provide free labor to the landlord. And this, this takes up a lot of uh, space in, in Malak which uh, the title has been 
translated as homeland. The sole idea of giving free labor, that they were forced to give free labor. And that is that comes right at the beginning of the novel and right till the end, this whole idea of bonded labor. The women of these, uh, this group in the village were sexually harassed and at times raped and murdered, as uh, Delphine Bias said. The men were brutally beaten, sometimes killed for crimes real and imagined. They were denied access to common drinking water ideas in my eyes when Dalpan Bhai was talking about his own childhood experiences. Uh, they were denied access to common drinking water sources. Of course, they were not allowed into the temples and there are great many uh, sections in the novel where uh, the protagonist, some of the, it's, it's an ensemble cast, so some of the protagonists are standing outside the temple and taking the darshan of the deity inside, and that too was not allowed to them. They were driven away even from, they were brutally beaten up even for that. Uh, as Dalpatva has already said, at their weddings, they were not even allowed to seat their rooms on horses, as it was seen as a challenge to the uh, power and prestige of the upper caste. Yet these Vankas' attachment to the land where they lived and labored under such oppressive conditions is very real, that this love for the homeland is very real. This is their malak, their homeland. So when they are driven out of their quarters and forced to leave their homeland over a sexual scandal involving a Dalit young man and the daughter-in-law of the village landlord, they suffer the trauma that results from leaving the land where they and their ancestors had been born, lived, loved, suffered, and even died. And as I said, this novel is a very powerful ensemble cast, uh, and their dark stories, which I have often discussed with Dalbad, but the stories are very dark, very sad, very tragic. But at the same time, there's a lot of romance, there's a lot of laughter. They are young people, they go to the mela, to the fair, they flirt with one another, and they exchange little clandestine gifts. And there are even comic interviews like the young man who was not allowed to sit on a horse, so they hired a camel for him to sit on the camel. But that finally became a tragic issue. But uh, there, are, there are very comic interviews as well. And Dalpur uh, Bhai has written his novel in what I would term a post colonial narrative style, much before post colonialism became an actionable kind of narrative as far as uh, Indian English writers were concerned. There are interior monologues, many, many interior monologues in the novel. There are interventions of the past into the present. And uh, this, this gives the novel a very contemporary edge. I, I just felt that it was very contemporary. And uh, even the language is a judicious mix of northern Gujarat rural dialect, very, very difficult and particular for me to understand, uh, and standard Gujarati. Also, in spite of the exploitative and brutal uh, uh, events in the novel, the novel does not lack beauty and even melody. At times, it's very melodious. It's very melodious, the novel. And the anger of the Vankars against their oppressors is mentioned through abuses. So again, very difficult to translate abuses. The very inventive abuses are there. Talbot Bhai has a whole repertoire of very inventive abuses. And uh, but they mumble them under their breath because as uh, the bonded labor, they can't speak it aloud. So this harshness is set off by lyrical passages uh, which describe nature and the sadness of loss, personal loss, not just the loss of the homeland, experienced by the different protagonists in the novel. And while uh, attempted to be faithful to the style of the author, a word-by-word -word translation is avoided. The author's style of short sentences, if he writes in very short, these malak has been written mainly in very short sentences, except for the melodious sections, which are longer sentences. And I have retained the short sentences so that there is a 
it gives the novel a kind of staccato effect. And uh, it's very abrupt when abrupt sudden changes. So this just mirrors the language itself. This language mirrors the sudden abrupt changes in their lives. And I've tried to retain that. It has not, of course, been possible to translate the Northern Gujarat dialect into a rural English dialect. I couldn't bring in a RD type of Wessex dialect or something into this novel. Would not suit the bill. Standard English that has a pan Indian reach has been used instead throughout the translation. Apart from authenticity, what is also at stake in any translation is the readability factor in the target language. So that was my major concern too. And uh, Malak has already been translated into several Indian languages. This is the first time that it has been translated into English. And I have read some of those uh, Hindi translations of Malak. And I felt that it was so much easier for the Hindi translator to translate it because she had the rural Hindi dialects of Dalit Hindi dialects to fall back upon and put into the novel. It really facilitated that uh, translation for them. But what helped me was discussions with friends, students, and colleagues on issues related to the Vankar dialect and the situation of this community in Gujarat. Talpatba later on, later on came up with a dictionary of this dialect, and that was a great help. Heartfelt gratitude to all who have helped me in this process. There is Dr. Rafila Rohit, who is here. I had many long discussions with him. There is Dr. Pragnya Shukla, who has helped me a lot. There is uh, one of Shrida's PhD students, Dr. Kruti Vyas, who has helped me a lot. So a lot of thanks to them, but of course, uh, any lacuna, any is my responsibility, not theirs. I also am very thankful to Professor Sanjukta Das and Professor Ramisu Rehman, whose encouragement and support enabled it to be published by Sahitya Academy. At the Sahitya Academy, I'm grateful to Mr. Jyoti Krishna Barma and all of those who have been connected with the publication and production of this book. For me, Sarpagbhai, this uh, translation has been a labor of love and has taken years. I've taken a very, very long time in doing it. And, but I'm very glad that I did it. And I hope that the readers find it, find reading it as much, like reading it as much as I liked translating it. Thank you. I now have the honor of inviting the chief guest, Professor Sitan Shu, Mrs. Chandra, to give us the novel analysis. Jefferson, this session, Mr. Shudder Adishnu, our gracious host, Pintiji, eminent uh, fellow participants, participants, distinguished professors, present here and present electronically. I'm very glad and grateful for this invitation to Mr. I'm struck above all by a fact that a pioneering novel by an author coming from 
community which has been on forced move. And this has been translated by a person who also comes from a community with some years, some centuries back. Was there a similar, probably more final displacement from one place to another? So, what is the meaning of? This meeting from an author of four displacement experiences by a translator who has similar experience and both share from the margins the standard language to which I belong. So, what is the meaning of this configuration? To me, it means that while it is important, crucial for a standard language, be it standard Gujarati or standard English, and the culture that the standard language represents, central culture, two things are important. One, to pay full attention to these uh, forced displacements and to look as two of my most distinguished Dalit writers, friends in Gujarati, have done. Dalpat Chawan, not only in this novel, but later on, and we'll come to that in a moment, and Nero Patel in his poems. And there are several others who follow this novelist poet and Nero Bai amongst Dalit writers who have furthered this journey. But this translation and the translator okay. also reminds me and should remind the standard language people that the periphery of a standard language is a large periphery. In the periphery of the society is also a large periphery. So the first point I'm making is this. It is crucial that Dalit writers, especially like Dalpan Bhai and Nero Bhai, they present to us not only documents, not only autobiographies, but as Dalpat Bhai has brilliantly pointed out the narrative of a whole thing. Crucial, equally crucial is, I believe, now in the times to come, a conversation amongst variously displayed, displaced, variously tortured, and variously fighting back. Peripheries of the standard languages and the standard culture. My first celebration is that Malak has played the trail and has led Gujarati literature beyond Panalal Patri. The dialect literature. In fact, Panalal Patel's society, the Patel's, the farmers, are now in this novel the cause of another problem. The Dalits they enter into greatest conflict with the farmers and the Brahmins. The Pratan has a generosity and sharpness of a major loss. Sharpness, the sharpness with which 
he presents Malak and Dijon moves from a village to a Kaspa town, Kaspa town to a city, and now he will move to the megapolis, I'm sure. Because he cannot be stopped. But equally, the generosity of the and this is a problem with that I have. Very often, the sharpness of a protesting author lacks in generosity, at least in recognizing other similar peripheral regions. So this is my first hope that one of the novels or a poem by Dilbert Bright could speak of other atrocities, non-Dalit atrocities. I met Shinu Ashebik in Berlin several decades back. And he knew Gujarati. He could listen to him. He could speak. Because he lived amongst the Gujaratis in his own school. So I asked him, right? and he was very kind to me. He gave me a signed uh, copy of his terminology. So I said, I am a Gujarati, and you have been harassed by Gujaratis in Nigeria and Africa because Gujaratis were not very kind to the merchants. And, and they secured, they tried to secure favor from the ruling class. So I said, he said, you don't know one thing that I know. I said, what? He said, Gujaratis might have, the merchants might have had a staff, but I know first had how many they were harassed by others, and Gandhi wrote about it. That's what you know, actually. This is the difference <laughs> between a writer of commitment who has sharp edge and a great writer who has compassion for all. I've read Malakampo several times, like all of us, and it was published in paper on one surprise. And extensively, I read it for a week before I showed it to you. I read it. I usually <laughs> refrain from uh, this kind of showing of uh, books because those who you know, tear the uh, cover, they see the book for the first time in the last time. <laughs> but I'd read it several times. But, Nilufalji's, and I'm using this word quite seriously, magic of translation. <laughs> magic in the sense that things that translate, the shifting of expression from one culturally embedded language to another culturally embedded language is an extremely different. Because other culture which embeds English language is very different from the dialects of it. So I, like a good teacher, started from the title. I said, Malak. So what does Nilfa Gurucha want? She says, Malak. Because I suspected that she would not know exactly what is Malak. But I was wrong. Because even on the Parsi periphery, yeah, people don't know the standard language as much as those who are in the center. And the proof of that is in the title Malak. Because what is Malak? How does Malak? How did Malak word come to Gujarati standard language? Now Malak comes from Mulk, and Mulk is a Persian Arabic language. Word. And it brings in all the associations of conquest. The so mulk is related to political power and to oppression of the time. Al mulk, something of al mulk, they are the lords of that mulk. And Gujarat then becomes a mulk. So, started. 
effort by which we use the word bala. So let me see how inside the novel, how is that word used? It's the last sentence of the book. So that mulk of Pashu Arabic language, which was the opposite of migration or displacement, rulers came from outside and he became ruled, which is all the major experience of Gujarat. And it should not be just brushed away. But how does a Dalit writer, a Vankar writer, how does he use this word? First, Mulk, the Tatsama, is turned into a Tatsama, Mulak. And when Tatsama turns into a Tatsama, whether in Marathi or Gujarati or any Bengali, any language, to pay attention, you listen to the people making it a dhava or a momentum of education, whatever. So, I ask myself, why does this author use the word, why doesn't he use the word like this? Which is also a very common word. Yes, Magyata. In Savarshati, this one Kata means when they went, they, even when they are in Andhavan, right there in Gujarat, or when they are in Delhi, right there in India, this is something in Kashyapur. So that, and Desi one was, is also so popular, so I, I find it shallow. But he didn't uh, use the word Desh. No, no in this novel, the Desh has been used. Or Vatan has been used once or twice, but not Vatan. Vatan is also, of course, uh, realized. So, and so what is Malak for uh, the people who have been thrown out of Malak? And at this awful of the text, they have been thrown out of Malak, but they will go to Malak. This is to my mind, the greatness of this. But what makes him a major effect? In the sense that Malak has been used in two ways. We have been thrown out of the Malak. And I must find out that the only last sentence, the novel. Amakai war to me nahi. No, hello, but I would talk. Malak-Jeho-Malak-Padak-Sah. I'm sure that anger will turn into a much greater compassion. I'm waiting for that. It is not happening yet. Not even they are born, not even Namde Vesar. I hope that the young Dalit writer who took that with compassionate eyes, with the pain of India, pain of all people, there's so much pain, there's so much mutual mourning, some knowledge and stuff. But this thing, this has played the trade, and there are other knowledge things which. Now, what happens when our Parsi translator translates death into English? Why do you? Parsi is a professor of English. 
both English, but no, international English and Indian English, every English. So the English is of various. So what has she done? So the mother has been read his land, her country, or whatever, region. So, no, he has added one word, homeland. And that's exactly what this means. The Malak that is left behind is home. And Malak, which is now, in the Dalits will create their own Malak. It will almost be like a conquest of the home. I hope it doesn't become a conquest kind of situation. I hope it becomes only an expansion like situation. But I don't rule out the other possible. But there are so many countries. And I'll come to that issue in the next two, three minutes. Are the Dalits being led? Congress or are the Dalit writers and Dalit community being led to compassion? Much greater compassion. Compassion of the great people, compassion of the great writer, great writer. This is my question. And Nilufar Baruja has home in on this word homeland. This other strike here is the home. They are displaced from the home. That's the problem. But they are strong people. And then this man is very strong. So he says, okay, we'll create a new mother. But the home is lost. And that loss is a theme of this problem. But that theme has not been underlined in the original text. And this great translator has somehow intuitive, like a good past. Whose home is gone or lost. But was created a home in Punjab. So much contribution. So I put Dalabai Namoji and the MCG Tata. So this word has come to her because this is a community which has learned how to make a new home. And not only your own home, but home where everybody is invited. Pass the generosity, to pass the friendship, to pass the laughter. So you are the little Guruji. Little Amate, Dinosaur Guru Chana, home shop. And I think that is a great contribution as a translation. I would like to uh, in five minutes. So, who is the publisher? I think that is a interesting question. We must ask ourselves. The publisher of this is Science Academy, or own academy, run by science, science by literary, by, by writers so far. Now, so what is translation? And what is publication? And who is the publisher? Because at one end, I see how noted here four types of translations. And one is translation as a zoo. English speaking people want a zoo in English language, which they could visit and watch. Say, oh, what kind of animals are animals? So, translation at his group explores other cultures as exotica. In many land, that the first novel, first translation is by Sahit Academy of India. I'm deeply suspicious of international publications. I watch very closely. Which books they choose for translation. And my suspicion does not decrease. So, is Indian life and its pain, all its pains and disasters, 
are they a true story for the Western culture? And what kind of books are these international publishers promoting? And why are they promoting? We must ask that question. Second type of translation is translation of an expansion of a own literary culture, literary and cultural conversation. The book is doing exactly that. From Bordhanam to Munshi to Darshan to Panala to Dalpa. That's an expansion. And we are waiting for the next one. Translation could be a stimuli, not an expansion, not an expansion, but a break. That's right. That's both the things. And that is the magic. I think sometimes, you know, it is puts a kind of how shall I say a knife and separates. And then no, you should listen to him when he's angry. And this is a service knife. But he has compassion. And so it is also a great and an expansion. You will be surprised what Jagannath, Pandita Jagannath, how he defines literary language. He says, Puna Puna Anusandana, Puka Gnana, Bhavana Gnana. He says, Puna Puna Anusandana. That means, you connect and disconnect. You connect and disconnect. That's what he's doing. He can take me to task if I tell him that you are expanding Pandita Jagannath's poetics. But that's not how he perceives himself. But I perceive his work as the continuity of Pandita Jagannath. He was also a great rebel. Pandita Jagannath was not an angel of Pandit in the origin. About that, into some in some other uh, and fourth translation is to make you see what you would like to see, and that is with a kind of I conclude my presentation with that. It makes you see what you would like to see, and there is a great defense mechanism in every country. They don't want to so how do you show it? In a film, a Jewish man is held by his neck by Nazi officers and brought to the women's section of the closer band that he, he look, 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 and his wife is being punished. Impossible to see that. So literature. And the arts are the only way. Whole people, whole culture learns how to see what is too painful to see. Then some of our Dalit friends they also don't want to see the other pains. Because there's so much pain already. There is no more room for very more pain. It's so human. But then literature is not human. It is something more than human. And I think what an unusually perceptive Parsi translators title and the whole book of our next several times we'll have a session two hour session for this some other day but uh, you know comparatively but capacity books like this and translations like this to enhance our capacity to bear pain and as Darcy Mehta has said Vaishnavijan Toh Vaishnavijan Toh don't forget that so. Not this, but this. Ane, nahi, ane. Krishna Vajanto, Tenere. Je, 
पीड़ पराली जाने वर्क जाने नदी किनारे पड़ाव ना बदा बैठा धीरे धीरे बीजा के नदी न कि ऊंचे जो जवाब आप रमती लोबू पगना भाग मई जपी नगो मन में गुजराती प्रयोग 
I can I could see from Divya's face that uh, she's trying very hard to understand the very heavy dialect. And uh, I think what also helped me in the moment you get into it uh, and you realize that they're saying the same thing with a little bit of addition, subtractions of cha and ya and things like that. And my mother came from Bilimora, a uh, town in South Gujarat, it was a village, and it became a town. And uh, she and her sisters, and especially with their mother, they used to speak in a kind of a rural dialect and Behiro and things like that instead of Desi Jao, Dehi Jao and things like that. So that I said, oh my God, this is the way my mother used to speak with her elders. So uh, that, that helped me the, by understanding the dialect, which was otherwise very difficult. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Bai, Professor uh, Sitanshu, the translator here, the Nukobarucha. I think uh, um, it's not necessary for me to comment anymore by virtue of the fact that they have been quite elusive and it will be more interesting to close this entire session on a very high note. Thank you very much. With that, I bring the session to an end. Uh, we are running a little late thanks to the technical glitch at the beginning of the session. But tea is uh, served outside on the lawn, so we will join us. We'll make up during the lunch time because it's about one hour, we can have a 45 minutes lunch break, right? It is. So, will you please join us? Thank you very We host the session. I'm Vidya Venkatesan, and I'm from the University of Mumbai. I teach French, and I'm very honored to be set to be um, chairing this panel. I'm here to learn as much as the next person. So we will uh, begin the session with uh, Professor um, Anisul Rahman. His books are here for those of you who want to feast your eyes and then afterwards purchase. Uh, Professor Adinsu Rahman is a literary critic, translator, and bilingual poet in English and Urdu. Formerly a professor of English at Jamia Media Islamia, a central university in New Delhi, and senior advisor at the Rehta Foundation, he's published in the areas of comparative translation, post colonial, and Urdu studies. He has to his credit five critical books, five edited, co edited volumes. Three collections of Urdu poetry in English translation and one collection of his English poetry, apart from over 90 essays and reviews in books and journals. Professor Rehman has delivered keynote valedictory panel and invited addresses at over 90 national and international seminars and conferences. His latest twin volumes, yeah. His latest um, twin volumes of Hazaro um, Kwaishe Essi, The Wonderful World of Kudu Ghazals, Harper Collins, 2019, and Hazar Rang Shairi, The Wonderful World of the Kudu Nazm, um, Harper Collins, 2022, showcase the best of Kudu poetry from the beginnings in the 16th century to now in English translation. Professor Rehman has been an academic administrator at Jamia Mila Islamia New Delhi and worked as head of department of English, dean students welfare, dean students welfare registrar, and director of residential coaching and therapy. He was a Shastri fellow at the University of Alberta, Canada, 2001-2002, and a visiting scholar at the Purdue University in 2007. Uh, may I request you? Thank you, Professor Vidya, for the invitation. I'm really grateful to you for your very kind introduction, kind words, and also appreciate the audience. Uh, friends, uh, thanks first to Professor Dilip for inviting me to this symposium 
and asked me to share some of my thoughts about my own experience of translating the time in New York. Or a little later, the first time in New York, the condition that really brought me to this. But the whole idea was to felicitate an author whose book we have discussed just a while ago. And we are, in a way, supplementing that kind of uh, discussion that we had what translation does to us now and what it does to our lives. And how does it really matter to us in the larger context of the way we're living? So, thinking of what Professor Baruchya posed to me about this symposium and what I should be doing, I'll talk a little bit about how I came to it. And later, I'll talk a little bit about what I did when I translated these two books, uh, which he has just shown. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, there is a proposition that I would like to make in the very beginning, and that's the very general kind of the point that I would like to make. It says that all of us in India are equal, we are all surely, but many of us trilingual and more than that are essentially translators. We do translate in and out every day without stop. I say so because uh, we have linguistic clusters and our languages speak to each other. Our similes speak to each other. Our metaphors speak to each other. Our symbols speak to each other. There is a conversation that goes on. And our myths also do contribute to each other and engage each other. And that's why I say, and I make this proposition in the very beginning, that uh, we are essentially translators. Uh, I will not elaborate upon this. The students of literature know this very well, so there's no need to do that, but I'll come to some other points. I'll be just making hints so that you can elaborate upon what I'm trying to do. That is the point. Translation thus is a very serious engagement in India today. And we have watched it especially during the past three decades or more. How translation has really changed the literary scenario <laughs> and how things are changing so very fast and new directions are being faced. We have just mentioned Sahitya Academy, you know very well that Sahitya Academy is a platform of the authors I've used by you mentioned. And lots of translation does happen there. So that is one point of reference. You made a very important point in the beginning when you said that who is the publisher? Well, this is not the, the book that I have just shared and just shown. It is not published by Sahitya Academy. But a larger pattern if you think of translation, that is what we do that we contribute to each other's work and we learn from each other's work. And this is though published by Harper College. The larger fraternity of translators that are developed around that makes a great sense to us in India today. So just as I said, there are three, four decades in the past, we have seen translators making greater space for itself in the classroom and outside the classroom. So this is one of them. It has also taken us to other areas that is for example, comparative studies and language studies in the departments of English more especially. So it is a very serious engagement as I would like to propose for the students of literature today. Studying literature in a monolingual situation and studying literature in a multilingual situation are two very different things. So when you study literature of English, is one thing when you study literatures in English, it's another thing actually. So when you study literatures in English, you also study translation them. And that makes great sense to us today. So, the study in India, for example, makes way for translation today in the classroom and outside the classroom. It makes great sense to study translation, both the theory of translation as also the practice of translation. This has brought us to comparative literature, which is one of the most important areas of current research, even though Steve Wong said that this is what we can go on and get. But uh, one doesn't feel like subscribing to that kind of idea. Uh, in one way or the other, we have been comparing our texts with one another. Uh, just as we have been, uh, say, with the linguistic intermixing, as I said, our language and our metaphors and our symbols too intermix with each other. So we are comparative also at the same time. There has been a lot of talk about world literature. I, think I do, not, do not really understand what it means, or what we really mean by world literature, but I'm not very sure about that term. And there's a lot of case made about it in the American Academy, especially, but that's not the point that we are discussing here about. So, this translation has made way for comparative studies these days, and it has made way for also the cultural, say, aspect of the literary production. That is how there is a cultural, uh, say, renaissance in a way you can say the larger world, is it? 
and how literary cultures interact with each other. Uh, actually, uh, Professor Baruja, let me tell you that the symposium didn't start this one. It started last year in itself when we were on the Dani Trail. We talked about how languages talk to each other, how our myths and our symbols to talk to each other, and how we really interact, listen to each other's language and the voices that come from that. So that is the point that I was trying to make. And this continued this conversation that we developed on the dining table yesterday, last night, also continued in the morning. And that is what we are trying to demonstrate here in a very informal kind of a situation. It actually has started last night in this morning. Uh, we, were, uh, we were studying British literature. Uh, we belong to the same uh, time frame. And uh, when we studied British literature, essentially, we, uh, my own experience was that it was, really, it was a very limiting kind of an experience studying British literature alone. So when we were students of MA, you would remember Professor Baruja. That was the time that American literature came into being in India. It was there, but they started. That was 70s, early 70s, late, late 60s, and the establishment of American studies research and trade. So that was another thing that came into, and lots of people started researching and studying mind. So it became one paper for us. See how things started changing from 70s onwards. And from there, we went on to something at that point of time called common milk literature, which is now known as what we have said morning, as post colonial literature. So from, from the British, we moved on to literature. There was a very limited experience. They went on to American literature. And from there, we went to Commonwealth, which is now known as the post colonial literature, or new literatures in India that we started. And the Flinders University of Australia, South Australia, that was the point of time when two, three persons from there brought in this term, new literatures in India, and later it came to the next post colonial, which is now a second. Uh, that's a matter of hyphenated post colonial or not hyphenated. That's a matter of controversy, not the point. Uh, post colonial literatures brought me to Indian literature. So that is how I evolved my own interest. I started um, taking its finding its place. That is how I started finding my voice as the teacher in my classroom and outside my classroom. So this post-colonial literature, this translation, this cooperative studies brought me to India literature much more closely. And it brought me to translation. It brought me to, uh, to, 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 to the study of Comparative studies and the literary studies how to speak and yes, and to literary from different literary traditions, or broadly speaking, two literary or three literary that just interact and talk with each other with the conversation around. So teaching then, teaching now has therefore become much more translational, much more comparative, and it is not read today in singular terms as you see that you know the study of the Christian culture. India is the place for this kind of study better than any other place. As I said, that we do not be no longer studying a particular kind of literature. We are studying literatures today. So the whole idea and the concept of literature has changed and the English literature, so to say, has taken into its own so many things that makes it. Okay. Yeah. So that is how it makes sense to me and that is how I be bothered that how we started what. So so there was a need for doing all that as now, this brought me to translation. Uh, my own uh, interaction uh, with my poets, uh, with the poets who, with whom I work, I studied, it happened in the classroom actually. That uh, I started realizing at a point of time that when I was teaching, for example, John Dunn, and if I brought him to Bali, for example, I would then Bali to understand what Wick was, what the MC was, it made great sense to us. So there was suddenly their eyes were lit up bright and they would understand, they would connect. Similarly, when I was teaching the, uh, the poets of the 30s in Britain, I was reminded of the poets of India, of, of India in the 30s, of the society was spoken. So there were many layers which I could connect. This brought me to Urdu literature, which I had already studied as a student and also apart from that, in Kormit family tradition, where people did speak, they then also had some training in Persian. Luckily for me, I also had some training in Persian in the school days. So I consider myself very lucky. And probably that was the last generation of persons who were students who were studying Persian also. So I was really rich that way that I could understand some of Persian, study Persian, and then of course the mother tongue. And Hindi, for example, which was also a part of the Sinai Bible. 
So I was trying to develop my own interest and I found it in how do I explore my own interests. So I thought that uh, at one point in time, Dr. Dubai, let me find out how many poems and books have been translated and how many books are available there for students who would like to research in that area. And I found, I started preparing a review. And uh, I found that there were 170 translations between about four years ago. 170 books of translations are from the poetry in the English language. I was trying to find out if there is a book or there are a couple of books which take care of the entire panorama from the 16th century from where you trace with the poetry to now. And I found that. That was the point from where I started here. I thought that let there be a, let there be a book, a comprehensive book of poetry and in English translation so that it can reach out and I can also reach out to my students and to my students. So first by trying to you know the poetry has been very clearly divided. Because one is the Ghazali poetry, you go on talking about that. But other than Ghazali, there is a huge literature available to us. So, this is the first book which I brought. This is known as the Garo Parishas. This was done by Martin Collins in 2009, and it takes care of poets from the 16th century to now 1765 poets and there. And uh, in English translation, the work takes is also outside in Roman. And then after that, I brought out this book, which is a complementary book, which is which is a kind of a uh, you can say this is a sequel to that book. So these are the two books which bring the entire corpus of the poetry. Uh, let me tell you how did I do this book so that you can have an, an idea of, of what was I trying to do basically. Uh, this Puzzle, you know, is very popular. I don't know need to speak about that and why I chose that. But Nazm is very different. In Nazm, you have uh, various kinds of forms, you have great variety in the Nazm. Uh, then you have, uh, uh, say, uh, you have uh, various rhythmical line patterns also. You have Bhavan Nazm, which is a very regular kind of a poem. Then you have, you have a Borra Nazm, which is a black word poetry. You have three verse, which is known as Azad Nazm, you have prose poetry, which is there. So this book takes care of all that. And the traditional Nazm, which is very well structured, very regulated thing, you have the modern Nazm, which is today. What was my translation strategy? Uh, I tried to catch the central thread of the idea when I was trying to do that. Uh, I tried to translate the visual form that the poem presented before us. So if you believe this, Sadaro Parishas, you can see that. When you read a puzzle, there are couplets there. So I try to do that visual translation as well, so that when you read, you are not, you do not know that language, you do not know that form. So you are in a position to understand what form that is represent. So visually, also you can see in this book that it appears that the puzzle is couplet form. I try to do that by counting the syllables. I try to do that by creating a kind of rhythm that the puzzle talks, because the puzzle does really works. So from there, I just started from putting the tie, I started, they came in the modern times. So how did I select? That is one question which is often put to me. I made my choice in both the books. I made my choice of the poets in the sense that I went to the very beginnings and looked at and they scanned Urdu literature, history of Urdu literature, right from the 16th century, full of the Shari, the first poem. From there, I started and come down to today's poets, Urdu's the born in the 60s, so who are now in the middle age of course now. So who established a tradition, who contributed to the evolution of an idiom, the, to the language, the form. So these were the economical books you want to make. There can be differences of opinion about why this poet and why not that poet that you have not chosen or you have chosen. So this is very all the time you have any questions, but choices are choices and individual choices are there. So, periodization is one thing which I did here. I tried to put them in different periods of time. Historically, and in a chronically order, I went forward so that a reader can get a complete view of how it went from one end, from one place to another place, from one situation to another, one geography to location to another, and one kind of literary tradition to another kind of literary tradition. That is what I was trying basically to do. So, I was trying to find out the economical force. This is what I clearly did. Now, let me, if you allow, can I read a few sample sample? Yes. 
Let me just give you an example so that you can take it by the way. Okay, see. Uh, let me read the first. This is the first book that I bought um, three years ago. And uh, this is the other book uh, that I was And it begins with Polypotosha. Polypotosha, you know, is the fifth emperor of the Polypotosha dynasty of Hyderabad. And uh, it's a very famous one that you can enjoy this book. This is what it is it begins with. Priyabaj, Priyala, Priyajayana. You have what you You are aware of this. It's also the thing. A Priyabaj, Yakti, Jayana. I can't get a drink, my drink, without my mind. I can't get a drink, I think, without my mind. Now, you'll see the first, the first she I want to say after it, because after it is different from she. So, drink and sing. Now, if you read the Bazaar, you will find that there is a Kafia and there is a Rafi. Kafia here is drink, sink, blink, drink, think, it keeps on varying. But Radeep has always to be saying that it has to be the same, for example, without my love, without my love, without my love, love. it goes on like that. And the nose is better. Mm -hmm. So the second share is Kahi the Piyabin Saburi Karu. Kahiya Jaya Kar. Kahiya Jaya. I should be patient, you say, without my love. How oh, unfair. I can't even blink without my love. The third share is Nahi Ishq Ishmu Barak Kuri. Kahi Ussaburi Pisi and Dai. This is the language of the 16th century, which we think of Charles writing in. So, Nahi Ishmu Barak Kuri, Kahi Ussaburi Pisi and Dai. A poor indeed is one who can't be in love. I'm not the world. I, I, I'm on the brink without my love. And the last share of this mother is the only four she is here. Udubsha, that they wish to buy him up. You see, this is the between the rhythm. If you say Udubsha, that they wish to buy him up, it's called something. It's not that easy. Udubsha, that they wish to buy him up, it's not a matter. But if you say, the shack that they were still to see the music, how it how the rhythm varies. So, Ghazal is very sensitive to this nuance, it's very sensitive to the reader, it's very sensitive to each syllable that really comes to the part of the So, Kutub Shah, not they wish the one in the part, the one in the book, which can't be there. Uh, no counsels for the Shah, none to this crazy one. I am the one, I can't even think without me. So, this is how it began. I give you another example, another example to illustrate what is happening actually in the nursery. This Kutub Shah is, uh, has tried his hand on all forms of poetry. All forms of poetry. He has written on the flora and fauna of India, especially in that particular region to which he belonged, on festivals of India, on seasons of India, everything that he can think of. And he was a great administrator at this time. You see, I began this book also again with. Let me read out to you, uh, say, as you said, the Urdu Bari comes. This book begins with Hamd. Hamd is a hymn to God. So naturally, that is how the Vatan cannot be done that way because it's essentially the poetry that you think of. And I was my essential argument there was that I was trying to put the poets into the body and not to sequence. But when I came to know my thought of the hip with which the book should start, let me read that in first. Chandra Sun Tere Nunte, Mistim Mo, Nura Nikia. Chandra Sun Tere Nunte, Mistim Mo, Nura Nikia, Tere Sipa Kilka Sipa, Tu Akri Hatraji. Tu Nam Muja Aram Hai, Punjim Sun Tuj Kam Hai, Subject Tu Tuj Se Kam Hai. इंस्ट्रक्शन now, this does not follow the same pattern of the couplets. 
and try to put it in a standard format because that is how it works in the English lab. This is what we were also talking about in the earlier session. Now, this couplet form changes here because it changes because the change is, is brought in order to, to place it in the, in the tradition of the language which is my target. This is a hymn to God. The moon and the sun bear your glow. Your glow turns the dark night into day. None can ever be as you are, or light and soul to this kind of thing. This is the kind of music that you don't also try to play. And my point is this that Urdu poetry is simply translating Urdu poetry is translating rhythm basically and a cultural order, a kind of a situation. So that is what I try to imitate here if I go back and try to get to this topic about it. Only your name brings me comfort in comfort I offer my life to you. I recreate your name. You are my rosary. You know this. You are my rosary. The world means to you as I do. They remember you. They're all yours. Your love is greater than the world's love. You know, you best know what the world desires. The sky sends its nearest from above. I look up to you. I know you are kind, kind God of heavens, who sends his grace. You have what I need to provide all I want. All and all you offer, I always embrace. In the last ten I said, the decking shows, showers all its grace on Kutub. Kutub adores his head with the prophet's feet. The only praise to you, to you, who else, as long as the soul the body. So here is a scheme of the second, the third line, the second line, and the fourth line. Back. This was the kind of line scheme that was there in the Urdu text, which I tried to copy here, not in the couplet form, but in the form of the, the stanza. There are variations and there are certain liberties that the process of money take with this one of the examples. Without taking much time, we take a big leap and go to the current time so that you can just have a taste of what is happening today. Uh, I'm leaving five centuries in between, not taking care. But I will just give you a few other words, some of the very important words. For example, the first in this book, which is the Nazam book, I begin with making a tradition. And I talk here of the poets, uh, bring poets here of the uh, 16th, 17th century. We move on then towards modernism, we go. Then we go to the progressive poetics. From there, we go to the new poetics. And then we go to the new poetics. And finally, there's a very important section in this book. It doesn't fall into any particular category because it makes an addition of its own category of its own, which is the womanist slash feminist poetics. Because these women poets have been for so I have just put a separate section of that. So let me just read when it comes handy to them. To give you an idea of how things have changed. Uh, uh, this poem is by a uh, poet called who's no longer alive, Sarbat Hussain. He is a Pakistani poet who committed suicide by the way of the on a train, a financial train. And his son today is a poet who is making the reader. This poem is called Man to Jay, Man to Jay Yark. I will read this verse and then I come to the English translation. Just to give you a taste of how poetry changes and how powerful the years the medium changes, the way of looking at Things change the experience. May to me, Yad Kabaka. Jabber Darach Haboshi or Badal Shurka. I don't know. Look at the simplicity of experience and expression. Jabber Darach Haboshi or Badal Shurka. I don't know. Yad Kabaka. Jabber Aurat Am Roshan Kabahidi. I don't know. Yad Kabaka. जब मैदान से एक बच्चे का जनाजा गुजर रहा था, आज मुझे याद है। जब कैदियों की गाड़ी अदालत के सामने खड़ी थी, आज मुझे याद कर रहा था। जब लोग इबादत इबादत गांव की तरफ जा रहे थे, पैर हाउसेस इबादत गांव की तरफ जा रहे थे, आज मुझे याद कर रहा था। जब दुनिया में हर शख्स कोई न कोई काम कर रहा है, I remember you when the trees stood silent, the clouds made noise. 
when a woman raised fire, when a woman raised a fire, I remember him. When a child streamed from the procession passed by the field, I remember him. When the prisoner's van stood before the court, I remember him. When the people moved towards prayer houses, I remember him. When everyone in this world was doing one thing or the other, I remember him. Friends, uh, this was how this uh, thing works. Uh, in Nazum, I have quoted from the first and then last and this is the last that I'm going to. This is one of the say I'm quoting from the Nazum, reading from the Nazum. Let me take one of the more This is the uh, Mr. Gordon, this book is named Padre Shah. Yes. You know that? Yes. Yes, Mr. Gordon Shah. Yes. Yes. Tera ghar aur tera jungle ki ite nasib se. Aisi barsate ke baad abhi. Tera nasib se. Pajpane ka saath hai. Phir ek se dono ke dhuk. संसार लड़कियों के दुख अजब होते हैं सब सच उनसे अजब हंस रही हैं और काजल दिखता है संसार में बारिशें जाड़े की ओर तनहा और मेरा किसान जिसम इकलौता है कमल दिखता है संसार Both your home and my jungle get wet together. <clears throat> Such heavy rains or the clouds <clears throat> get wet together. Yes. They are cohorts of childhood, their pains are the same. <clears throat> the scars of night and that of mine get wet together. What a bizarre world. They are the move with daggers in hand. The glass bowls, the sandalwood, get wet together. He was with me no matter what curse, what light, I get wet. The crazy one who gets wet together. The pains of girls have a strange, their truths a stranger. Both their chuckles and their thoughts get wet together. together. The winter rains and the poor peasants all alone. His lonely body and the holy blanket. Constraints of time, there are no examples to do. Let's give you an idea of what I was trying to do. The whole idea was to try and present a large window, two large windows. I was just trying to provide a kind of a material for what? To develop a comparative literary studies, to be able to compare two different cultures, two spaces, two languages, two metaphors, or two things that our language is today. And that is how I started my presentation. And they say that we essentially are translated into a multilingual state. Very, very different from the monolingual state that these things are. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Anisul Rehman. Uh, I'm told that we have a discussion later. So, um, you know, keep your questions and your comments ready. We move on to Professor Sanjukta Dasgupta. Uh, Sanjukta Dasgupta is Professor and former Head Department of English and former Dean Faculty of Arts, Calcutta University. Is it called Calcutta University? Yes, we are Calcutta University in Calcutta. <laughs> We are Mumbai University. 
<laughs> she has been the recipient of the Fulbright Postdoctoral Fellowship and the Fulbright Scholar in Residence, Australia India Council Fellowship, Gender Studies Fellowship, University of British Columbia, Translator Fellowship, DCLT, University of East Anglia, Norwich, among others. Apart from invitations to participate in national and international seminars and conferences, Das Gupta has taught in lectures at universities in USA, UK, Europe, Canada, and Australia. She served as the jury member and the chairperson of the Commonwealth Writers' Prize, United Kingdom. She was the convener of the English Language Board of Sahitya Academy, Ministry of Culture, as well as a member of Sahitya Academy's General Council from 2018 to 2022. In 2018, she taught in Poland as a um, visiting professor <coughs> at the, not sure how to pronounce this, Jagiellonian University, Jagiellonian University, Krakow, there's something in here, that's what you can do. Sorry, Krakow, Poland. Um, she received the IWSFF Women's Achievers Award Kolkata in 2019, the WEI Kamlakas Poetry Award in 2020, and the EPOS Literary Award in 2022. Uh, Sanjukta Gupta is a poet, short story writer, critic, and translator, and has published 26 books. Abu Madam. Where is he? The only thing I know. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. It's wonderful to be in Mumbai. Back home, we call it Bombay. And Bombay and Bollywood are invisible out there. And so I'm very, very happy to be here this afternoon. And I thank uh, Professor Nilupur Barucha for giving me this opportunity to be here among stellar uh, distinguished um, academics as well as translators and also authors who have been writing for decades. And I feel that up to this point of time, I have learned a lot. And in fact, Munipur's uh, partner, Springer, who's sitting there, I met them first at the Jamia Media Islamia University where the uh, invitation for attending that particular translation seminar came from Professor Anisur Rahman, who's a good friend of mine. So, I know you don't have to imagine how old you are. All right. So, you saw Anisur's books. Yes, mine are absolutely size zero. <laughs> yes. And you can blame it on the boards. They look okay. How can I expand them? Unless, of course, I'm David Brooker. I'll come to that. But now, being an uh, academic, uh, poet, writer, whatever, so uh, my presentation will be a bit oriented towards the academic. And I have sort of split it into three parts. But I will not uh, scare you. I should be able to finish in uh, about 15 or 20 minutes. So, uh, the time to, uh, given to each of us was about 25, but I will try to make it, uh, you know, I can, of uh, two years, what I've learned is I can even edit as I'm reading my own paper. It's a merciless way of doing it. It's a sort of more worse than the violence that a translator does for a translator. So the, of course, as a Bengali from Kolkata, I need to start with a particular poet. Otherwise, I will absolutely look upon as prejudice. And that is proving an idea. And of course, all of you, even the students, you cannot avoid Tibor because the national anthem is fine. And it's not translated. Yes? We pronounce it in a way that it sounds like Hindi, but in Kolkata, we try, uh, uh, while singing it, we pronounce it the Bengali way. Now, one poem of Tagore, which I think all of you at the school stage at least had to be or were forced to be familiar with, 
was where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free and the world has not been broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls. And that is the theme of this world, uh, this seminar. Translations, reading, linguistic, social, and political divides. Yes, the world has not been broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls. The ability to transcend through translation. All of us can't go out in the streets and start talking about a movement about inclusivity and diversity, but we can do it in our own way, in our world. I am quite scared of going out into the, into the woods and um, raising a flag. But my activism is my own writing. And my activism is my uh, translation projects as well. Now, what I also want to repeat to Tagore is that Tagore was the first Asian translator to translate his own works into English. And he was awarded the Nobel Prize in, in uh, 1913. He translated them in 1912. What's interesting and what I want to really share with you is when the translation prize was declared, the Swedish Academy, that is the Nobel Prize giving community, did introduce Tagore's Gitanjali with in these words. Tagore's Gitanjali, a collection of religious poems, was the was the one of his works that especially arrested the attention of the selecting critics. Since last year, the book, in a real and full sense, had belonged to English, had belonged to English literature. Yes, here we have to. We are all trained in postcolonial criticism. Yes, and so belonged to English literature for the author himself. No, my education and practice as a poet in his native Indian tongue, not even language, has bestowed upon the poems, and instead of writing translations, what the English poem writes, has bestowed upon the poems a new dress, alike perfect in form and personally original in inspiration. What an expansion of the definition of French. Yes, a new dress, a life perfect in form and personally original in its tradition. None in that Swedish academy had ever read or heard of the English poetry when they was true. Now, I want to move a little further up here and again refer back to bridging linguistic, social, and political divides, when the Swedish Academy also adds, this has made them, that is all the, the English translations, this has met, made them, that is Stigall's forms, accessible to all in England, America, and the entire Western world for whom local literature is of interest and moment. Quite independently of any knowledge of his Bengali poetry, irrespective to of differences in, of religious faiths, literary schools, or party aims. And now listen more carefully. Tagore has been hailed from various quarters as a new and admirable master of that poetic art, which has been a never failing concomitant of the expansion of British civilization ever since the days of communism. When we read Tagore in English, we also need to pay attention to how it was recognized and celebrated. And as post-colonial students of post-colonialism, I think we need to pay attention to the politics of translation and the politics of awards for translation, which uh, Professor Sitamsu had already pointed out in the morning session. So I will move from here to Tagore's own way of describing how he was enjoying himself while translating. These are 
he has written uh, copiously about this. I've, I've just selected one little piece. Where he has even gendered the process of translation, yes, by feminizing translation, yes. So he says, I really enjoy making new versions of my poems. It has become an addiction. The poems I've written in one language to write the same poem in a different language is a matter of deep pleasure. To me, it seems as if it is the deception ceremony after marriage. The husband has been united with his wife, of course, but when the others savor for the first time the rice cooked by her, then the union of the bride and the groom becomes a matter of the world too. When I wrote the poem in Bengali, then the union was between the poem and the poet. Now when I am in the process of making English versions, it is as if the rice cooked by my bride is being served on everyone's plate in a feast to which all have been invited. Therefore, the joy in this is very different. This ritual has excited me and has permeated my mind. Yes. So I think we'll not linger here any further, but again, referring to Aristotle Rahman and comparative literature, I will talk about this uh, tremendous, um, I think, resurgence of interest in the Western world about translation. You know, because the Bible was translated already way back. But it, in the 19th century, there was a movement led by Getty and even Marx and Engels, not Marx and Spencer, yes, <laughs> Marx and Engels. So that happened with the emphasis that national literatures are also ones which are about territories, borders, and mountains. The emphasis should be on world news. How can we read world literature without translation? So translation industry virgin, at that time, nobody called it an industry. This, it was not about marketing, buying, and selling. Much later, translation now has become a huge industry in the globalization period. But then, who is reading who is another uh, political uh, platform for which we need a very different seminar and for maybe two days. Now, what I want to reach here is that Getty has said, national literature is now a rather unmeaning term. The epoch of world literature is at hand. Everyone must try to be hasten with its approach. So, literary translation and all of us are really translated. See, when you are looking at me, you are speaking, but you are not saying what you think. If you say what you think, the translation and don't say, no, I don't know what you are thinking. So, order. So, from this, I just want to go to one, one bit of translation. Uh, I had to add this because Anusul is gone. This is about the translation of Omar Khayyam from the available English translation by Fitzgerald Wolsby more than uh, anthologies are available in Bengal, all the Bengali translations of the Rubai. And apart from that, there are 50 others, and the 15 are the ones which are recognized by the Bengali Department of Calvary University. Now, among these translations that were available, Tagore, of course, again, pronounced it and said, what a brilliant work you have made. And of course, Winston himself was a translator. Fitzgerald found the manuscript in the Balliol College, Oxford, of um, Omar Khayyam's poems, and then he translated. And the reliability of that is another question, that is another seminar. But right now, what I'm trying to emphasize is that Shobai, which is actually small lines, comes to the early, and the Bengali words, we love reading. So the four poems sometimes become eight lines, sometimes become 16 lines. Yes, each stanza becomes 16 lines, yes? And 16 half lines, the advantage of writing poetry. Yes, so all of this happened at a, at a juncture where among 
when we see a towards who are experimenting with what we accept Nazrul. Nazrul translated from Umar Khayyam, sat down and learned Farsi, and then translated in pottery in form. But one of the most celebrated Bengali poets, who unfortunately uh, died much earlier than he should have, and Professor Sitam Sumul, I'm sure, Professor So what he writes about translation and the freedom of the translator, which is why Sometimes we do not call it translation alone, we call it transcreen. And this is what Kupti Chakrabha said. My indebtedness to Fitzgerald Slahi is not a mean one. Wherever it has been possible, possible though, I have adjusted the mind to the perspective of the land of Bengal. I have dragged the Ganga and Bhagirati currents into my translations. I have made the Persian rose blossom alongside the flowers and foliage of Bengal. I did not pay heed to what is acceptable and what is not. In my translations, I have been at the very height of self-indulgence. I have done all this for my own pleasure of recreating Omar in London. So with full awareness, I have changed the youth in Omar's lines to a goddess, and I have changed his Allah to Ishwar. Though I've made it, everything so topsy-turvy, I'm confident that readers will forgive me if I'm able to create the aura of Omar's immortal lines in my version. Instead of all these translations and Oh, I tried. These are all in Bengali. And of course, very briefly, I tried to translate. But what has Fitzgerald done? He has been what? Translator, translation theorists like Lawrence Venuti and many others have all the violence in translation. And translation can be an act of violence, an insensitive appropriation and abrogation for self fashion Translation can also be about initiating networks of cultural connectivity through linguistic community. It can simply affect the transference of the alien source text to the domain of the target language and its reader by domesticating. And that is what Shukitan did. Many would say it is not a translation. If it is a poet translator, then, of course, there is this sort of risk and possibility because the poet is so creative that the very scramble hold of sticking to literary translation sometimes becomes a problem. And this, of course, uh, I mean, would know very well. Now, quickly, in my second part, how are we doing for time? Yeah, yeah. So, the second part is what we have been celebrating in the last. Six to eight months. Gitanjali. Yeah. Now, Gitanjali Shri for her Hindi original, Red Samaki, and Daisy Rockwell for the English yeah. translation of Tomes of Assembly. Two books, in books. Yes. Who are recently co winners of the Man Booker International Prize 2020. The award money of this prestigious prize has been shared equally, giving translators both globally and locally a much needed shot in the arm. It's a great recognition. From 2016, the Man Booker Prize is being given to both the translator as well as the original of it. began with the Korean um, novel and comes. Novel Vegetarian, which was translated by Deborah Smith. In, and since then, and I will just, there are very intelligent people here, I will just uh, refer to the fact that Tones of Sand has been published by Deborah Smith's publication house, which he uh, put up after 2016, I think 17 or 18, he started that publication house in London, and Tones of Sand was published by Deborah Smith. 
and we will not go into any particulars of this. But what I want to point out is when Daisy Rockwell was asked about her her own particular translation and what she wanted to prioritize, we had stated one should not view a translation as an imperfect representation of a superior and unattainable origin. Read translations, read translations as original works, and you will be much happier. People always obsess about what is lost in translation. It has become a cliche. And then she goes on uh, elaborating on this and says, what is a translator to do with a text that is focused on its own linguistic? I have striven throughout my translation to recreate the text as an English body of Hindi, the resonance of Hindi. Seeking out word plays, echoes, etymologies, and coinages that feel Hindi esque. I have also included many fragments of poetry, prayer, prose, and songs in the original language alongside their English renderings and even the occasional fragment of the original that was too good to leave the And she says, all this is also a part of the original, that is, Rex one. And this second part, I will just conclude with Namita Gokhale's um, remark in the Jaipur Literary Festival, where she was asked many times, why don't you have Amita literature? Why don't you have regional uh, literature uh, forums? And she said, in my understanding, the confrontational nature of literary politics between the languages is a theme of the past. In the age of the internet, it is possible for all languages to coexist and speak English. So now I'll come to my own humble efforts about my own translations. And here I will also try to specify the fact that translation, as a practicing translation uh, translator, I've noticed that the, there are three practical categories. One is self-translation, when you are translating your own and you know the target language very well then the form tends to change because of the demands of the time. One is self trend The other is solo translation, with, where you're translating on your own. And the third is a group translation, as Anis has done, where you bring in poems from various poets together and put them. Now, I have had experience in all these three categories, and I would be very grateful to Saitya Academy also to, be, to have given me this opportunity, especially in terms of group translation. Now, group translation is very, very challenging because the one which I was engaged in at Kolkata was a volume of 36 short stories in Bangla compiled by Puni and the twin, uh, we selected 24 translators to work in that workshop and finish the work within a week's time because we had already circulated two months back the originals and asked them to bring in the draft translation to the table during the work. This is the main problem. Again, a problem that has been referred to also in the morning in terms of time. All of these stories were not Kolkata based stories. It was not urban stories. They were not about shopping malls and cafes and things which you find in an English edition. These were all in Bengali dialect. And there was not even a single Bengali dictionary available in the site, regional site academy office in Kolkata where we found figure out what the dialects would translate as in standard Bangla. And we felt so, you know, so twitched, so uh, that we as Bengalis, we talk, it, uh, talk the language, uh, we speak in that language all the time, 
we can understand also looking at yet you know I'm just touching on this because I know there's no time to elaborate. The workshops also happen in this month in Delhi. The second was a group of women writers from all eight parts of uh, India, that is the northern part. So there was Dogre, Punjabi, yes. And so we took about eight uh, of these short stories. The good thing was that it is known as the Northern Road, as you know. The Northern Road is English. Happy, uh, uh, really happy accident, you could say. They didn't have to translate. It was already there. So apart from that, of course, in all the seven languages, we have to translate. And it came out as a book called She, Contemporary Women Writers of India. And finally, the book that I want to refer to is Indian folk narratives. Now, this has been really a foundational text. It is truly path-breaking because it contains folk narratives of 53 languages. Prior to this, this anthology, A.K. Ramanujan has folk tales of India with 23 languages, translations from 23. Ours is, it's free, and ours I had no uh, claim to fame for this at all. It was Ramkumar Mukhopadhyay who really uh, collated and gathered these stories from various parts of India and then translated into Bengali. That volume was a big And then again, the video uh, as a regiment of translators, yes, about 18 translators. We met in a workshop in Africa, and there we translated again in the whole in the, all in the between, um, languages and about, I think, 133 stories. The good thing about folk narratives is they're half a page, one page, two pages. Yes, they uh, really caught brevity with the soul of literature. None of them were very long. But it was something that we felt very happy about doing because such an anthology was non-existent. And that probably was one moment that we were very happy about. And I really want to uh, conclude referring to my uh, title. I called it Between Art and Corona. And here I was not uh, being very original because it was poetry who had once made this remark. Translation seems to me, a, to me a craft in a way that cabinet making is a craft. There is no substantial theory of cabinet making and no philosophy of cabinet making, except the idea of being a good cabinet maker, plus a handful of precepts relating to tools and to types of wood. And we can complement ourselves as translators because the first cabinet maker in Western history was Jesus and his father. Yes. And so uh, I will just come back to my own translation. Now you'll wonder what she's done in these two sin books. So what happens is if you know the language too well, and Dalpa Ji will be able to tell me about that, and of course, those of you, is the resonance of the original. However, if you are familiar with both, does not seem to be very true in the English language. I'll give you an example. See, in Polakaka, in this particular book, there's a poem about a girl getting lost. And let this recite in Bangla and Hindi. So it starts like, Shortu Amar Neem, Shortu Amar Neem, Shongi Nide Dakshunte Te, and he said, 
The girl's name is Bhami. And so um, the reply is, Harie is young, I'm lost. In English, if I said, what's the matter, Bhami? And if I said, I'm lost, Mami, yeah, it would be a trivialization. Yes? So just listen to how the English sounds in terms of the meaning, the meaning resonance of the Bengali language, which is very rich in terms of its uh, use of liquid consonants, which is why it sounds so sweet, you know, it comes from having too much of which you know. Um, so, so I'll just read the English version. My little girl, as she heard her friends calling her, she went down the dark stairs, taking frightened Steps. She had a light lamp in her hand. She sheltered its flame with her siren. I was on the terrace in a spring night with a sky full of stars. Suddenly, hearing my daughter's cry, I rushed to find out and noticed she was going down the dark stairs. The wind blew off the light of the lamp. I asked, What's the matter, Bunny? Yes. So I will just conclude with another poem to tie this up to the theme, and that is bridging all borders, linguistic and political. And this is Tagore's poem, again translated by me in his book of patriotic poems called Swadesh. Yes, this was uh, published by Vishwamari. Mm -hmm. See the scene of it? So, this is called India, a pilgrimage. How do I just read the first four lines in Bangladesh? Kevor Chitta Kundati Teja Pedhire, Evi Bharate Mahabani Shabot. Eshwe Arjo Eshwe Arjo Jitta Musalman, Eshwe Kwaj Tugi Uraj Eshwe Krishna. Ishwar Brown Horn, Shuchi Kori Horn, Hollow Hearts, Shabakan, Ishuni Potito, Hollow of the Mother, Song of the Mind. The only person ever asked to cleanse his hands, purify himself before he comes to the pilgrimage of India, is the Brahmins. Yes, so I read the English translation, and that will be the end of my presentation. Oh, my soul, in this holy pilgrimage side, awaken softly at this seashore of Bharat's great people. Standing here with arms outstretched, saluting the human god, in a free verse, with great joy we invoke the spirit. The earth in deep meditation, the river like a holy chanting shade, the flowing fertile plains. Here you can always see the pristine earth at this seashore of Bharat's great people. No one knows who is it that has beckoned so many streams of people like a tempestuous current they came from somewhere unknown, only to be absorbed in the sea of Bharat's great people. Here are the aliens, non-aliens, here are the Dravidians, the Chinese, chalk, moon groups, Pathans, Mughals, mingled inseparably. The West has opened its doors, many bring gifts from there. Keep and take, mix and mingle, not to return. This seaside of Bharat's great people. Welcome Aryans, welcome non Aryans, welcome Hindus, Muslims, welcome, welcome New English, welcome, welcome Christians, welcome Brahmins, cleanse your soul, build everyone's hands, come subalterns, let all insults be raised. In the mother's coronation, hurry and join, the holy pitcher is yet to be filled with everyone's touch. Pilgrimage side will be purified today at this seashore of Bharat's great people. Thank you.
you so very much. We enjoyed the Bangla, we enjoyed the English, and we enjoyed the various um, very important points you made. And we're looking forward to a discussion. We have five minutes. So if there are any questions, um, they will have to come out for about really quick. May I ask? You will you use two words in your translation, which uh, I was very intrigued by. Um, you mentioned, you use in your translation the word rosary, and you use the word grace. Are these, weren't these for you too culturally embedded uh, to be, because I, I, I mean, as a translator, I face this problem. So how, how does one close over here? Grace. Grace. This is okay. Yeah. Your <clears throat> translation. Uh, I must say that you have made it very, very deep and very, <laughs> if you may say, very relevant question. Rosary is something which you hold in hand and you can count the names of God. And there are hundreds of these there. So that is initially a lot of Grace is something which you can't define. It's not physical. Grace is a condition that uh, you are in or you expect to be in <coughs> or to receive from God. So be reminded of the poem by effort to drop it from us. The poem. Mm -hmm. the poem. Is there is talk of grace. So one was something which was a very uh, physical experience, and the other was something which was not physical, but something that you could realize by being a part of the whole system of belief. That was the kind of distinction I was trying to make. So, but what would were you tempted to use the Urdu word itself? Uh, I think there it is the street. I don't know. Uh, can I, can I just, uh, I mean, the rosary is not, uh, for even as a Parsi, we have the uh, rosary, they use it uh, for prayers, the names of God again, counting, them. We're counting the names, the Hindus have it, the Muslims have it, the Christians have it, so I don't know how culturally, I mean, the uh, Greeks had it as well. So I don't know how culturally embedded it. Were you thinking of a Christianity? Yeah, it's very. Well, uh, it's a no, yeah, girls, when it's just here, you know, when you look at the etymologies, I personally I have faced this problem, yeah. which is yeah. the reason I've always chosen to go with the word of the language. Uh, because I have found that this was a, a problem for me as a translator. Uh, you made a very relevant point for the problem because it's, uh, it's very common in many, many of the places. Mm -hmm. So all of us who have that kind of a rosary head, just to facilitate our memory, how how many times we have counted. Yeah. So you might forget if you do one or two before, so you forget for a job. So a rosary helps you to read, to be, to be very excited, precise to be counted. But it's very common and you are right there. Mm -hmm. now, but the question that you have posed was, how do you address that in translation? That's fine. The second question that was about the grace. Grace is something which is indefinable. Something which you can experience in the deep spiritual exercise or experience of your life. So grace that way is unconstant. It cannot be. But then you try. Now, the rosary is the medium through which you can reach that grace or you can be a recipient of that grace. So that distinction is of course very, very, very delicate to make. But that is how you translate and negotiate with the kind of shades of meaning that might differ from one physical object to another physical object. Can I answer that? Yeah, I can well understand, understand Vidya's question because she is a translator of Western literature. And so the rosary is deeply embedded in Western culture. And in the missionary school where I was for good conduct, about the rosary. Then Hail Mary is followed by one hour. And I keep on chanting. Yes, I never did uh, things like a Hindu prayer with the mala and it. Yes, but in school, in Breath the Nuns, I used to do that. And so rosary sat in my understanding uh, the way you have responded to the word rosary and even grace. Because so grace, again, in the Christian. Uh, understanding that is the religious text in uh, in Christianity raised to plays a role where see how colonized our minds are. 
and how to use mind. Thank you. I wouldn't go so far as to colonize mind, but uh, because today we do, uh, I don't know, I have a problem with cultural uh, medicine, and I'm not saying I have an answer. Uh, I think any translation is a question, actually. Right. As you know, we keep it, so, yeah, you know, and there are no answers. We just share each other's doubts, hesitations, and um, hopefully somebody else solves it and comes up with another question. Because, like I always say, we're researchers, right? We look again and again. We're not finders. So, uh, any questions for the uh, from the students? No, they have seen this slide. No, I think the person has uh, Jerry Pinto will be coming in in the next session. That's how they have to be on this From the sea beach. From the beach. From the beach. From the beach. That's what we But before we take the language, would we offer a mentor to our speakers as well as the chair, Chika, to Professor Anisur Rema? Yes, yes, yes. Professor and have a chair. So we we'll break for lunch. Our next speaker will be there in your schedule, Jerry Pinto. We have shifted him to the session after lunch. Okay, so we have lunch first. And we then two, right? Jerry Pinto is joining us online from Goa. And some yeah. other things will be joining us from a lovely beach or something. So let us see where each one I think let us uh, try and finish lunch as soon as yeah. possible. That was a very good question. Yes, that should be a little bit. I was ambitious. Uh, friends, you are welcome to the third session of the day. And uh, we have one presentation here in person. And then you have two other presentations. Mm -hmm. One will be joined by uh, from Goa, oh, uh, is not here. And the other, uh, which is already recorded by Professor Gili Ramakrishnan. So we go in that order. We we'll just first have uh, Professor Vidya Vinkarishan, and after that, we'll have Jerry Pinto, and then Professor Gili Ramakrishnan. Yeah, and uh, since she has to leave, and we have to respect that, therefore, after her presentation, uh, the session will be open for a few minutes for questions, answer, or comments if you have. So, shall we begin now? Yes, with your permission. See, uh, just a word because it is important for the listeners that they know who we are going to uh, listen to. So, this is about Professor Vidya Vakitation at uh, the Professor and Head Department of Brain and Enjoy Director Center for Infantile Studies, University of Mumbai. And uh, there are some great words here which I can't remember. <laughs> uh, research areas include comparative study of King the French and Indian Indian traditions and contemporary French and Francophile literature. Committed to literary translation, Vidya has published a French translation of Kavira, first book we call you, but what is the French? Uh, and this is what she is going to talk about today. This is the book that she will be talking about. This is the translation of Kavira, first poetry. Nazul, so to say, we were talking a while ago about, about Nazul and Nazul. So these are the other paradigms only that she has done in the French language. Actually, for reaching out beyond the Indian leadership, and this is the book that brings the French leaders from Indian going that way. So thank you very much for doing that and bringing us uh, this kind of uh, really to this leader. Now, uh, our numerous national and international publications and research journals have lectured in several institutions in India and abroad. He has been awarded two national awards by the Republic of France and uh, the Republic of Italy. He is the editor in chief of the only Francophone University Research Journal, Synergies, and published in France since 2006, about time now. 
2015 years. She's also the coordinator of the master's year with Erasmus, that MA program done by the University of Warren. In collaboration with the consortium of eight universities, European and non European universities. Quite an impressive bio that we have had. Better without losing time, we we'll just go to her talk and may I request you to please give her a chance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ami Suleiman. Pleasure to be introduced by you. Uh, the French words were meant to impress anyway, so I hope you're impressed. <laughs> so, um, this is regarding um, my translation of Javed Akhtari. Um, this will be a little personalized because um, people often ask me what me with Tamil as my mother tongue, what am I doing with uh, Urdu? Uh, I have even been asked as a Hindu, how can I translate Urdu and so on. So, you know, I take it in the, that Indians have a taste for the comic. So I'll leave it at that. But I would like to tell you as to why I came here. I think the location of a translator is very important. Uh, it's a very personal journey. So you will bear with the autobiographies for the details. Um, it's, you've heard uh, important experienced people talk. Um, I'm only two translations or a few translations old. So I had no theory to offer. I've come, gone straight to practice and from there, try to do some, um, some things for myself to learn. And then I attend seminars where I learn, learn so much more. So uh, we heard great theoreticians speak. I, and we also heard the voice of experience. I come from a very limited experience personal experience and hope you will have the patience with your meal. Uh, let me first begin by giving you my location because unless you know where I come from, you won't know what I'm going to say. I heard Javed Akhtar recite his poetry before I read his published work. I don't write or read good. Uh, Mr. Akhtar had fortunately had a good idea of publishing his work in bilingual editions. That is, I read the same poem in Devnagri, which a script I'm familiar with. Um, as a poet, he appealed to me because he came from a very interesting background. He was um, Muslim by uh, birth, as he liked to underline, but atheist by choice. He was a feminist, and he was belonged to that um, now expanding group of um, secular without a certain connotation as we know them. Um, his work appealed to me. He came from a generation, a family of seven generations who wrote poetry. So, as he says, he didn't want to sit in his father's shop and chose to do everything else and actually turned to poetry only when most people have given up writing poetry. He wrote film scripts before he wrote poetry. He was a product of the progressive writer's movement, but he writes very little poetry for a cause. He comes from an atheistic Muslim family and he insists on the Muslim because there's also a culture that uh, you're embedded in and you may not believe in uh, some things, but yet you're embedded in that culture. So he calls himself an atheistic Muslim and with pronounced feminist themes. Mr. Akhtar writes very little conventional love poetry, romantic poetry. He says he needs to be paid to write romantic verse. But he that and so he obviously does it only for Bollywood. He's deeply interested in politics, in science, and its latest discoveries. Urdu poetry has been translated in bits and pieces into French as part of an anthology, but never an entire urban. Contemporary French poetry is very central, a solitary exercise for the poet and an equally private experience for the reader. The equivalent of the Urdu Mushaira existed in France in the medieval times. It was called Les Joutes Poétiques. And, but today, very few French people know about it, unless you study medieval French poetry. They studied less and less in France and certainly not in India. You don't even know that there was a concept called Joutes Poétiques. I wanted to take contemporary Urdu poetry to France. Its orality intact or at least in the empty, with its leftist ideology, its modern tropes of galaxy, black holes, godlessness, urban state of slums, hunger, communal riots, 
I must say I was very anxious. We had all grown up with the Roman Jack with Roman Jacobson, who said poetry by definition is untranslatable. <laughs> all we can attempt is a creative transposition. As soon as I started on this perilous path, I knew that Jean-Yves Masson was right. Translating a poem was an eminently paradoxical exercise because the aim was a mimesis, which was impossible. Translating a poem was out of the question. I had to recreate it. Urdu was not my mother tongue, nor was French. But Professor Christina Hage, a uh, Bojel Prize Awardee, an eminent translator, head of the translation studies at Tarakwa, Sorba Nouvelle, assured me that you don't necessarily know your mother tongue, nor do you translate better from or into it. What is required is the ability to tune in to another frequency, to accept with humility that two languages and two cultures so far apart that synchronous would be impossible, if not undesired. I always believed that I was working with two languages that is two cultures, the source language and, the, and culture, and the host language and culture. I prefer this term of so, to source and target, because in the term host of privilege, I find the culture of hospitality, which is vital to the understanding of any good translation. My translation of Javed Akhtar's Ergo in French uh, was the very first that was going to be. He had already been translated into English by David Matthews uh, in 2001, and David Matthews and Ali Hussain Mir in 2014. Uh, David Matthews had chosen to translate Nazars and Nazars, and uh, Javed Akhtar was of the firm view that Nazars could not be translated. Uh, it required another kind of skill and an uh, ability to host in the other language. Um, so I prefer to stick to the Nazis. So Ghazals have a very codified winter verse and structure. A foreign language not familiar with these elements will host the genre well, will not host the genre well. And so it was decided that I would only translate the Nazis. I also opted for the blank verse as a genre because any attempt at rhyme on my part as a translator would have meant, in this case, that I sacrificed imagery or even simply legibility or comprehension. So, for example, I'd like to read a little bit of a poem of his called Dora. No, sorry, Dora. This is a poem he dedicates to his daughter. I will read a little bit of the uh, Urdu and we'll forgive my non native speaker pronunciation. <laughs> and I will do a little bit of the French because I know you don't understand French. <laughs> and also because um, I believe you'd be able to flow with the rhythm of the language. You don't have to understand it, you can just tune in. So, Raha, Apni Beti Zoya Kela. ये जीवन एक दो राह है नहीं एक दो राह है पहला रास्ता बहुत सहल है इसमें कोई मोड नहीं ये रास्ता इस दुनिया से भी जोड़ नहीं इस रास्ते पर मिलते हैं दीपों के अंगन इस रास्ते पे मिलते हैं रिश्तों के बल इस रास्ते पर चलने वाले कहने को सब सुख पाते हैं लेकिन टुकड़े टुकड़े होकर सब रिश्तों में बढ़ जाते हैं अपने पल्ले कुछ नहीं बचता बचती है बेनाम से उलझन बचता है सांसों का नियम जिसमें उनकी अपनी हर पहचान और उनके सारे सपने जल बुझते हैं इस रास्ते पर चलने वाले खुद को खोकर जग पाते हैं ऊपर ऊपर तो जीते हैं अंदर अंदर मर जाते हैं दूसरा रास्ता बहुत कठिन है इस रास्ते में कोई किसी के साथ नहीं है 
कोई सहारा देने वाला हाथ नहीं इस रस्ते में धूप है कोई छाव नहीं जहां तसली भीत में दे दे कोई किसी को इस रस्ते में नहीं जहां तसली भीत में दे दे कोई किसी को इस रस्ते में ऐसा कोई गांव नहीं ये उन लोगों का रास्ता है जो खुद अपने तक जाते अपने आप को जो पाते हैं तू इस रास्ते पर ही चला मुझे पता है ये रास्ता आसान नहीं लेकिन मुझको ये गम की है तुमको अब तक अपनी पहचान नहीं सो फॉर एग्जाम्पल दो I am violating the original. Okay. Um, then the idea of um, under under, upper upper. These were things. For example, French allows me to say also far and deeper. That means deep within. So under under is actually conveyed by that depth, which far. And then your thing does, but I can't say upper upper. I have to say ala surfas. You know. Similarly, there's another one when he's talking about katar and then katar. I can't I can't say kul dona kul. I have to say ala kul lul. Now this is a very little. This is very infrequently used as a uh, expression. And it's even passed off as probably register three, as we call it. Which children use or use colloquialism, but katar and that katar could only go to go with ala kulu because it allows me at least that liquid concept. Uh, one of the first problems I ran into was the fact that Urdu had no capital letters, and the nazms had very little or no punctuation marks at all. Javed Akhtar recited his work. So for the nuances from the nuances of tone, pauses, body language, the listener understood without any punctuation marks at all. Sometimes there was the odd full stop or question mark. Other times there was a blank space between verses. But my French reader would need some help when he read it quietly in the confines of his room. So I decided to introduce a capital letter to indicate a change in the course of thought, to suggest a variation in the tone. Although I, I use punctuation marks by the Urdu original habit. Now here we also run into another problem. The poet is so used to reciting his work, he's probably never proofread his own work. So some very wise editor could have introduced something. So you go back to your poet and you say, and he looks at it like he's looking at a new piece of literature. Because he's never read his work. See, he's only recited it. And as he recites it, it's, it's so imprinted on his soul that he's never looked at all this thing. It's only recently, and he's 78 plus, that he says, the dear keep a book handy in case I forget, which is, you know, which is not the way he's thinking. Um, according to uh, Francis Pritchett, Western derived punctuation marks used by modern editors is a barbarism. It sucks the language of its polyphony and polysyny. Mani afreni, as it's called, lies in the multiplication and enrichment of meaning. It is the art of creating a single verse that will elicit two or more different meanings and or will trail along with it many strands of implication, kinaya. But by not imposing a punctuation mark, I allowed the text to leave itself open to interpretation and the reader to construct the meaning, uh, a, a, a practice which the French reader of poetry is familiar with. Uh, then came the problem of meter. Urdu meter is very complex. 
It requires a trained ear to understand its nuances where even one quarter of a syllable counts. Each language has its preferred meter, and these meters have high cultural portions. Each French literature, in spite of its bold experiments with Verre and Verre, has finally fallen back on the Alexandrine. Meter cannot be translocated. Each language has its cadence, its respiration, its stress. Then, like I told you, it's already an English translation. And um, I belong to the old school where I believe I would like to work with the original. Um, and so far, I have managed. Um, because like I said, there is, a, there is a music to that language, which I need to tune into. And this is where I would like to express my deep and abiding gratitude to Satyanarayana Hegre, who is a lawyer by profession, but an uh, Urdu Arabic, yeah, extraordinary Arabic Urdu Persian scholar, and um, a remarkable human being who will put aside all his fancy lawyers, files, and cases, and find time for somebody like me, and actually buy me tea and something to eat. And we would spend evenings, and neither of us would understand when the sun had set and was, was about to miss his last train. So, with him, I think it's a joy to work with somebody like that because uh, people usually get irritated with my questions. I have too many questions, and I have too many doubts, and I sort of end, end up confusing the other person also. But with Satya, that's not a problem. You can ask for, I want the etymology, how has this evolved, so what if it is Arabo Persian, how has it changed, but I don't agree with this. He didn't lose his school with me at all, and I think there's four we translators that actually make me very grateful to a whole lot of people who actually contribute in innumerable ways, not only to our translation, but to actually enrich us, because any translation enriches you, and I think um, these people who come in to add this each layer to your life and layers, perhaps, are very important people. Satya was my um, was my guide. Um, now, the strategy chose, and actually, another an earlier translation in another language, even if you don't use that as base your translation on, is very helpful because one thing you, I think, first thing you do is you salute the earlier person that he picked up the courage of taking on this job. And the second thing that you do is that you find out what is his strategy. Do you want the same strategy or do you want to take another strategy? If he took that strategy, why did he take it? I'm not somebody who'd like to dismiss something as a good or a bad translation. I think we need translations, not bad, ugly, we need them. And hopefully somebody will come to improve my ugly translation and it become good. And there'll be somebody else who come later who'll make it wonderful. There is no final version. If I had to do this book again, I'd do it completely different. So there's no final version. And I think the seminars like this, and thank you, Nilo, for the opportunity, gives us a chance to air these doubts, these hesitations, because we all the same religion, right? We, we understand each other. We come from a common background. Uh, we all are translators. Uh, we're all trying anyway. And uh, you know where I'm coming from. And probably the path you chose will help me. I may not go down the same path, but it will light up another parallel road which might lead me to some kind of, I won't say compromise, I'd say it's a choice. I know compromise is a very sad word. We all make choices. It will help me make my choice. So the strategy of the English translator was very different. And I thought that the semantic range of Urdu, which was so vast, um, I believed could be rendered into French because there is a place in the French language for the unsaid. And there's a lot of unsaid in Urdu poetry. Urdu has a lot of place for silence, for space. You know, um, it doesn't crowd you. As a translator, I, I, I don't like to feel crowded. And Urdu doesn't crowd you. And similarly, French doesn't crowd you. I always make fun of them, uh, having known them for 35 years now is that when the French say something, they're actually thinking of something else, saying something else, and meaning yet another thing. So even daily parlance of French is actually going through this very circuitous route. So if you're told something in French, don't imagine you've got it all far from it. You're probably the tip of the iceberg, which is what the translation is all about. Um, 
then the other thing that I find very tricky are proverbs and idioms uh, that a poet uses very easily, an expression which I understand. Mu uh, mod lena, for example, when I close my eyes and I say mu mod lena, I see this gesture. Okay, but the French don't see this gesture. They need to turn their eye. Okay, so I have to decide that I'm going to say turn the face, which means nothing to my French reader. And when I say turn my eye, then hamra um, pana, kisi ko hamra pana. If I say companion on the same two travels the same road, I'm going into another ideology. So I will have to say, find the side. That's when I will not slip into another political ideology. Then uh, an expression like aune paune ke da. Okay. I fortunately found uh, this is uh, this thing he uses in Dachi Basti. Um, in French, you can either say for a mouthful of bread, but I was moving registers completely. So I settled for um, something very cheap, is something that costs three times something in French. So I translated only for me as three times something. As far as possible, I stuck close to the source text as I could. Akhtar's poetry is rich in repetition like all oral poetry. I chose to keep the repetitions and even some constructions which convey the meaning in French but are never used in conventional French. For example, he says in a poem called Shavana, where he describes their, um, their friendship which went into marriage and which he says, even marriage has done nothing to subvert their friendship. Um, so he says, Shavang. Ye ai din ke hangari. Ye jab dekho safar karna. Yaha ana baha jana. Isse milna usse milna. Hamari saare lamhe. Aise lagte hai. कि जैसे ट्रेन के चलने से पहले रेलवे स्टेशनों पर जल्दी जल्दी अपने अप, अपने डब्बे ढूंढते कोई मुसाफिर हो जिन्हें कब सांस भी लेने की मोहलत है तभी लगता है तुमको मुझसे मुझको तुमसे मिलने का ख्याल आए कहाँ इतना भी हो सके ओके सो यू फाइंड अ लॉट ऑफ तुमको मुझसे आई हैव चोजन टू कीप इट एस इन वा it's not a, a, an acceptable expression in French. You won't say it. Uh, even in parlance, you can't say it. Why, mom, why, why, no, it's little children say it. But I had to keep it because here it is just two individuals in question. In spite of that railway, garden, railway station, they are alone. They are two travelers. So I have to keep that expression. And another problem that I have is, um, I think it's part of the progressive writers uh, thing, in that they break the, uh, they use a lot of English words, radio, radio station, train, and so on. Now I'm translating into French, what, what language shall I bring in there? You know, so I had to completely leave that part out. Um, um, in Tachi Basti, the first word reads awkwardly in French, but the images are haunting. He says in that, that where the where the where the sewer is flowing on the forehead of the street. Okay, so in French, when this when you read it, it sounds awkward. But uh, my reader and this I get from feedback from the reader, she stops and says, "Once again, I'm lost. What forehead? How?" And he says, "It allows me to get back to that." Image. So that is a call I took. Um, at other points, repetition brings uh, an image into sharp focus. Galia, galia, or galio me galia, you know, which was which is really beautiful in Urdu, but I have to settle for duel lune a pelopa. Because if I said duel three times, three hours in a French poem won't work. In Urdu, the second person singular and plural are distinct, namely tum for an equal and aap for a superior. In French, this is possible because of the who and the tree, so that helped. Um, 
and uh, you know the English remains ambivalent in this, whereas in French it's very clear when he's saying tree and when he's saying foo. Um, I had I took a conscious decision not to put footnotes or end notes, which would provide clarification, explanation, or any other sort of spoon feeding. I decided that the francophone reader who chose to read Urdu poetry in translation should familiarize himself with certain terms pertaining to food, clothing, given the popularity of Indian cuisine and fashion in France. I could not translate roti as roti because it would have become poti, which is a roasted pig, you know, one that they hang over the pig. Then. So it was wrong in every sort of way. So I actually settled for, and I didn't want to say naan because it was a little upmarket bread and all that. So I just stuck to chapati because that was a term they were familiar with. Asman ke thali, thali mein chan ke roti hai, or translated as to lassie pushiel, lali ne kama chapati. In this poem book. Uh, I believe a translation is never really a perfect fit. A sense of alienness remains. So Javed Akhtar sounds perfectly French, and then the Urdu has been erased. Uh, there has been immeasurable loss of meaning and content. So when the Hanfi poet dreams of his mother feeding him, Ek Nivala Pati Ka, Ek Nivala Gore Ka, Ek Nivala Haluka. The French translation is une bouchée pour l'éléphant, une bouchée pour le cheval, une bouchée pour l'ours. Even though this sounds strange, because the mother, the, the, the French mother doesn't feed her child with her hand, she's shoving a spoon down in mouth. Um, whereas this conjures up, the Nivala conjures up a whole imagery of the mother or the caregiver talking to the child. He's perched on her head. She's coaxing him to eat an entirely cultural context alien to the French. Um, they just seat him on a high chair, put a, put a plate in front of him, give him a spoon and say, you know, increase or don't be. Whereas in India, children do grow up with this pleasure still. Similarly, I had a problem with the word anchal, which is trans I translated as le pont du sabi, but this was where Ananda Devi helped me because in Ananda Devi is a French writer from the, from Mauritius, and obviously her characters wear saris and they have anchals. And she does like swirl it about. And so she says, form you sadness. So I just lifted that expression for her and uh, informed her about the scene. Um, so uh, then I had a, another, uh, this thing when he talks of uh, uh, Mother Teresa, that's a very famous poem of his, where he criticizes her for her ambivalent attitude towards the unequal society uh, that keeps people in dire poverty. Interestingly, she's called Ma Teresa, but she's addressed as tu, as tu. So I could do the same thing. I could call her Mère Teresa and call her Chu. So there was both uh, the, the, the Saint Mother Teresa and there was two of, of uh, you and me. Um, the French, obviously, the French reader always wondered why I didn't use a boo for the Mère Teresa. But uh, when I explained and he had read further, he was quite okay with it. And um, so I agree with uh, Professor Shukanto Chaudhary that we must move beyond the modern standard translation being faithful or unfaithful. Les belles infidèles is what we call them in French. Let us accept that no translation leaves the source text intact or unviolated. In conclusion, I would like to say that translation is only a provisional coming to terms with the alienness of an image. It is this alienness that makes this new literary creation because any translation is a new creation, rich in possibilities, pregnant with possible meaning, bursting with money after money. The act of translation necessarily threatens the text, whether it enriches it or impoverishes it. No equivalence can, let, let alone total reflection, is possible. Synonymity, even within a language, or even more so between languages, is a copulary. Languages are two unique verbal entities. They will not coincide. Two cultures, two paradigms of the mind cannot match. As translators, we create resonance. We work with echoes and correspondences that both lives spoke about. We are the biblical passer. We carry ideas from one river bank to another. The intellectual endeavor of translation is a cultural encounter we stage. Much creative energy is unleashed and ripples are set off in both cultures. 
our own position is constantly revised because we discover the insufficiencies of our own systems for meaning and signification. The act of translation for me is an ambivalent experience, politically loaded, existentially charged. But I'm one only a few translations old, but I'm trying to feel very important. Like Walter Scott said, translation is the afterlife of the text. So that was my very first experience. Translator who is so very, very important, the politics of translation also. Uh, before I speak a few words to say in order of, uh, in order to the chair's privilege to share a few thoughts, but before that, uh, she has to leave. And if there are questions or observations or comments, you are not going to do that very briefly, very short while only. Please go ahead if you have any questions or comments. But no one is still seeing at all. No. Just please come forward if you have any questions or observations. Uh, I just wondered about you said your readers in France. So has it been published in France or published here? No, it's been published in France. It's Edition Genus. But yeah. what we've done is something interesting to Javis earlier. He said, we will, since you say they go, they've forgotten about the Jute poetic, we do bilingual readings. So we've trans tra traveled across Europe, even Mauritius, Morocco, and places like that, where we do bilingual readings. So he reads the Urdu, and I read the French. So, and it's in Morocco, really, that we got the most moving response. You know, we had, we read out, uh, there, was, uh, there was a poetry festival in Tikwan. Where they called us and it was initially a very um you know snooty affair uh it turned out to be i mean they actually they ex it, exactly what would happen in Oshaira happened they stopped him they said say it again and remember they don't know french and sometimes it was after my translation sometimes it was in the middle of his rendition so uh, that's where we got feedback from readers so then i immediately get into uh, talk to people ask them how you received it and you know, obviously areas that were problematic to me, I even try to underline and say, how does this speak to you? And uh, so far it has been very, uh, very enriched. It is been, it's something that is sort of uh, talked to me a lot because, you know, you think you know a culture because you've been working with them for hundreds of years. So you know, not really. And uh, you underestimate. And as they, one of them told me, if I've chosen to read poetry, I'm already somebody different from the average. If I've chosen to read poetry in Urdu, you can trust my intelligence. You know, I, I think that's a very valid point. I mean, how many people just go and pick up a volume of poetry or a poetry from a faraway land who know anything about it? Yeah. 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 I just uh, you said that uh, some of the translations that you did, some words you used violate the rule of translation. But isn't the idea of translation that it should reach the masses and people who don't read the original language? So can it really be a violation of translation? I agree with you, but you know that's that those are the choices you make. How much do I want to be understood? Uh, how much of that understanding do I want it to be participative? Where I want him to come 50 percent, him her to come 50 percent, and me go 50 percent. Uh, to what extent I'm going to say, no, boss, I stand here. Come on, walk over, make the effort, find out. And as this reader told me, I read poetry, madam. I'm not the average normal reader. I read poetry. So, you know, treat me with respect. That's all. I completely agree. He says, you know, people write, he says, your uh, introduction did not tell us India, what is India, where, you know, because you know, because Urdu poetry, we know what the India is. We may not know your country, but we know what it's about. So your translation was respectful of the reader. Which I thought was, was a good point. I, I bear it in mind for my for the rest of what I do. Uh, friends, uh, I don't think we have any questions here. But let me just tell you one thing, which is my personal observations about uh, our translation and the poetry of the uh, I personally understand that the poetry of the is not too difficult to translate into English. The reason being 
that uh, I was uh, yesterday looking at the board and the meaning of that particular board and that it exists in the dictionary, a statemental. So they say either a statement or a statemental, there's nothing wrong with a statement. So far, I thought that there was a word called a statemental. But uh, there's so many statements in the poetry of Javita. But within that statement, you have lots of things that you can find in this statement. But what Vidya has done, she has read his poetry, which was more of a statement. She has found very interesting meanings in that. And as a translator, she has been able to look into those meanings and try to reconcile how as a translator she can come up with kind of a negotiation that is possible. And really, very, I never thought about it with that. You made such few important, so very important points, though I translated poetry in Urdu. You said that Urdu doesn't have capital letters. It never occurred to me. <laughs> and second, what do I Yeah. And the other that, and which is very interesting to know, that Urdu doesn't have any punctuation, and it suffers because of that as well. Only the uh, some of the later publications of the verses of the poets have put punctuations there. Like, for example, Gali was never aware of any punctuation, comma, full stop, exclamation, he never, never did that. But uh, no less than a body called Gali Institute in Delhi, which has published a volume of Gali Divan, has punctuation for that. Gali never wrote any punctuation. Because the beauty of this language lies in just doing what it is from. It's for you to understand where the punctuation is, where you have to break the line, where you have to emphasize or not to emphasize. But many of the modern editors are put punctuations. Actually, they are, they are not really serving the poetry or the impact that poetry should be making. So that was another very interesting point. The sensitivity to the language that you have. And I don't know uh, how can you do that? I'm you see, I am a complete Mashaira and but I'm a poetry junkie. That is uh, that opening. I have to understand. Yeah. Uh, you go for an Assami strategy. Like, uh, that opens another area of conversation that we will not do today, sometime in What happens in Mashaira and uh, who are the Mashaira audience and who are the Mashaira course? Because in Urdu, there is a bigger division. Ye Mashaira ka shayar hai. Ek matlab iske aap Mashaira hai nahi. Ye Mashaira padta hai bas. Anyway, very interesting points. Uh, they are very, very helpful to you. You know, I spoke about the role of a translator, which you yourself have tried to understand for yourself, for your own consumption. One very important point that was made by his experience is say that the reader, when I do it, when I translate, before me, there is no reader. I do it for myself first. It by proxy becomes you, that is the reader. So I don't know what is your take on this. I do it for myself. I'm translating anyone. But I'm doing it as a translator, trying to engage with that poet. I have no idea of who this reader is. The reader will vary. So if, if by proxy, you will respond to my translation. And these are some of the important points we have made. Translation, uh, say, and uh, uh, you began with romantic option, hell with romantic option. Translating in spite of it. He says that he's un intranslatable and also, and also, the author also says, mother is not translatable. In spite of that, people like me, who is that people really? So that really opens questions. And these are very interesting questions we have really raised. Nuances of language, translation, all this is a very tentative exercise. I remember the word said came to our university. You remember he said wonderful thing in the, in the we gave him that one risk also. And he made a wonderful speech there. He says, All knowledge is that all knowledge is tentative. All knowledge is tentative. Therefore, all translation is there. So in spite of orientalism, orientalism remains to be interrogated again. So he says all knowledge is tentative, therefore all translation is tentative. And when you will look at your own translation as I do on my own, I find that oh, I made a mistake here. There was a better word line somewhere else. So all translations are real. Very, very sound observations. I really congratulate you for so sad that I can't read translations into your French. Thank you very much. Now, if we have a medical department, if she has to leave, she can. She can. Yes, but if she has time, we are most likely. Thanks. Uh, the next speaker is on that. Jerry. Okay, Jerry Pedro is here. Right? Mm -hmm. Friends, we are now going to listen to Jerry Pedro. Yeah. 
Uh, I personally wanted to meet him, but uh, and again, one of the reasons uh, coming here was to be able to be here a little because one has said that I've known him as a writer. Uh, but unfortunately, that has not been possible. He is not here. He is in Goa, in Afghanistan, as we have been told. So here is a brief bio note, uh, which I must read so that we can hear about those who are online to be able to understand and to be able to relate with him a little more closely. Now, Jerry Peyuto is a poet and a novelist and a journalist and a translator. These are the identities that how we know them better. He has translated many works from Marathi, Hindi, and Kokri into English, including the Water of Blue and the Spectral of Blue. His poems and novels are in English. He received the prestigious Science Academy Award in 2016 for his debut novel, <laughs> and the Big Who? Big Who? His novel also won the Hindu Literary Prize and was also shortlisted for the Commonwealth Book Prize. His work in the non fiction genre, Helen, The Light and Times of Edge Bomb, uh, has also received by this particular acclaim and was awarded the National Award, Film Award for the Best Book on Cinema in 2007. Jerry Pinto's work catered to the vast audience as he has edited, curated, or written the stories of the spectrum of age groups. Uh, let us now listen to to Jerry Pinto, and after that, if you have questions, you can come forward. Two questions, two papers to letter, and then we'll take up all the questions to me. Let's you can start. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me, Dr. Barucha. Uh, I hope I'm audible to all present or to those who are listening. Um, Am I audible? Yes, you are. You are audible, Jerry. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, I thought I would actually, instead of um, giving you a paper, and since you obviously are very pressed for time today, and it's been probably an interesting and action packed day, I thought I'd, I'd uh, tell you a fable of my own devising about translation. So once upon a time, there was a land called Monolingua. It was a land where there was only one language that was spoken, one language that was in which people thought, one language in which they communicated, and their life was fine. It was perfectly good. But they, I think the human instinct is to strive for something better, and they kept wondering whether there was not something better to be had. And so they consulted their oracle who lived up on a hill. The oracle was, of course, an old woman. And she said simply, that you have to go across the river of meaning, which flows past monolingua, and get salt from the land of the lingua, which is across the river from you. And so a young woman volunteered and said uh, that she would go do this. She would go and get salt from the land called multilingua. And she fashioned herself a boat and rode across the river and got to the other side where the people of multilingual greeted her with great joy and said, we're waiting for you, how nice to see you. And she explained her, her quest. She said, you know, uh, my land is doing pretty well. We have no problems. There's nothing wrong, much, much wrong with us. But we thought our life could get better. And we asked our oracle and our oracle said that if you go across the river to the land of multilingual and get some salt from there and use it you know, in your cooking, it will, it will, uh, it will improve your world substantially. So she said, uh, the, the multilinguals who met her said, wonderful, very happy to help. And uh, you can take all the salt you want. It's free. There's no cost involved. But we have one rule. We never allow salt from multilingua to be taken away uh, unless uh, um, we don't allow you to take it in bags. The only way you can take it was you take uh, you have to build a boat out of salt and take it across the river. The young woman who had, uh, who had volunteered said, uh, I'm really sorry, but this sounds ridiculous. And the people of Multilingua said, I'm sorry, it sounds ridiculous to you. The salt is free. You can take as much as you want, but you have to take, make your boat out of it and take it across the river. You can't travel in your, your original boat. So the woman was with... Uh, uh, was a bit startled by this, but she said, okay. And she started, she fashioned a boat 
she fashioned an ore made out of salt and she pushed her boat off into the river and almost immediately the river of meaning began to grab handfuls of salt from her boat grabbing bits of it and she rode but she rode frantically and she got halfway through and you know to the current of of metaphor which took a big chunk of her boat then there was the reef of idiom and that took a big chunk of her boat and that took a little bit of her boat and finally as she dragged herself to the to the bank she had barely a handful of salt left and the people of multilingua looked at her and said is this all you got and she said yes but i will go again that is the fable of my own devising for what uh, for what translators do we produce them. i when i told this story i remember at a, at a literary festival in bangalore or in delhi can't be sure uh, my interlocutor was uh, the wonderful antara dev sen and she said you know all the salt that uh, the that the river took out of the boat was lost it was it was mingled in the river of meaning uh, it was mingled in the river of meaning so it in some ways will also help uh, my uh, monolingua with its uh, quest to have a more improved or better lifestyle so i think in general our translation has in many ways improved and bettered our lifestyle now i know i'm talking uh, to the mmias in the university of mumbai and there will be many people who are polyglots who are who uh uh very wise in many languages and well versed in many languages for the but for the man on the street in india most of our knowledge of something as fundamental as religion even comes in translation in my own story i am a roman catholic i do not uh, speak aramaic which is the language in which jesus spoke i do not speak uh, hebrew which is the language in which the old testament was written i do not speak demotic greek which is the language in which the gospels were uh and so i am reliant on what must be a bouncing translation a translation has come across several languages and several filters and now has arrived in the language in which i speak english uh i think it's true of say someone who's trying to to be a buddhist today they will probably read the tripitaka in some translation and maybe they will read it in pali but most of the time in some translation i believe most of us have some access to sanskrit and uh, so we do know some shlokas perhaps we know perhaps some prayers but a lot of what we know is what has come to us through those translators our grandparents our parents who told us stories who told us uh, more the moral tales out of the out of our language out of our religious books so i think uh, this country especially is indebted to translation in a in a huge way uh, one of the tests that i set one of the tests that i set for my students at the communications media department that i have been teaching for more than 30 years at the beginning of the year and these are post graduate students drawn from across the country as i say write down the national anthem on one side of a page and on the other side of a page write down the meaning in english or in any language that you choose i find that even the bengali uh, students find it difficult to translate the national anthem uh, easily and in its full register so i believe uh, when we live in, in a country such as ours which is naturally air to to hundreds of languages i once asked professor devi how many languages do we have in india professor and of course we know that we no longer talk about dialects because that's offensive for language that doesn't have an army as napoleon put it um and he said 1537 but we are still counting now i see 1537 languages as an amana it is something that is handed to us it is not of uh, when people talk about my
my language it is our language it is shared if a language is only one person's language then it is not a language at all it is of no use to any but it's like having a fax machine and no one to fax anything to so if you have a language that no one else speaks then you are actually in charge of a dead scroll it's no longer a valuable resource except inside your head perhaps uh it is only when language becomes a shared commodity when it is shared in a community when it is treasured and valued by a community when it is used by the community when it is even abused by the community and said in and by by abused i mean it is mauled slightly it is changed transmuted uh reunderstood reinterpreted it is only then that a language really acquires life so i would uh, this is really as much as i wanted to say to all of you i felt feel that very privileged to be a translator i feel the privilege came to me through the education system that i had which uh, made it necessary for me to learn to read and write in devnagari and uh, in uh, romi the roman script um i then chose to learn to read and write urdu myself so then i'm beginning my first baby steps in urdu translation last year i finished my first konkani translation uh, aided by damodar mao so uh, the nyanpeet award winner whose uh, latest novel i translated um all these experiences have enriched my interaction with english which is the language of my self expression and i've left me i hope think a better richer writer for for it so in in translation there is always an other directed act that is you want in at least in my experience of translation i want other people to know this book i want other people to experience this book i want other people to have to share the wealth of this book and therefore i have translated it but there is also an interior motive a selfish motive and that selfish motive is that i get to play in with language language gets to play with me as well and in this rough and tumble i come out uh, with a sharper sense of what language can do and what language means to me uh if there are any questions i'd be happy to take them now otherwise we can go on i mean you guys can go on with the next uh, speaker you can have questions and observations at the end of the symposium that is the session so we have the next uh, presentation by professor ev ramakrishnan A highly respected academic that you know, and he has been there the scene for a very long time now. And uh, one wish was here, and you could uh, or you could have interacted with him, but he's not here. So I think maybe that is all now. Is there a lot? We all have this sort of subject which is kind of a rise of frustration and competitive studies, but now we have a question very very well as a, a poet and as a translator. And also here today, Professor Vidhi Ramakrishnan is a, a literary critic, an Indian English poet, and author of many books. In Malayalam, nine books are there in Malayalam, and most of them are not uh, put in the titles before and not really pronounced them correctly. And unless you do something correct, it's not a good idea. Unless I mean that it will be pronunciation of the books. But I, I have great respect for the work he has done in Malayalam. And most of his books have been awarded. So he's a very well awarded author that we have in our midst. The students of English literature would be knowing that Professor uh, E. V. Ramakrishnan, his critical works in English include Making a Clear Modernism in Malayalam, Marathi, and Hindi, which in 1995 his book was published and a few decades ago. Locating Indian literature texts, traditions, and translations to the other than the Indian literature in 2017. And Michael Bachman's critical introduction, which is a very new book, one looks for what to read in the Carol Tree for. That's how we do that. He has published four volumes of poetry in English, which include terms of theme, new and selected poems, two thousand and six, and tips for living in an expanding universe, two thousand and eighteen. I have a copy of this and this one. Poems, 
among his several edited volumes of literary differences in India, text and center of Swiss 2011, Bhaktian explorations of Indian culture 2018, and Tree of Tongues and the Modern Year from Indian poetry and then short story 1900. I think this is a, a very brief kind of thing. I also remember one thing is that he also edited, I think, for Savit the Cat, the of the short stories, if I'm right. Uh, he retired as professor and dean of humanities in the Central University of Gujarat, after which he was professor in in 2018. He is uh, presently he's an honorary professor at the Department of English and Comparative Literature at the Central University of Canada. Professor Dibi Ramakrishnan, you are most welcome to make your sister. It's a great recording. But is he available on my hand? Hold him, we'll find out. Okay. So let's listen to him. Just give me a minute. Yeah, he's gay. Yeah, I'm just stopping the recording for a minute. To this uh, uh, seminar, where translation is in focus. Dear friends, Bombay. That's a brief one. And the Yeah, it is. 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 Not needed. The you are breathing your own stale hair. I mean, air for a long time. Predicting the boosting. But to what purpose? They ask them to sing they turn around and say, My throat is not all right, my hair is not all right. My foot has a problem. Like ours, you can do it. Yes, please. Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. And so we are into the last session of this absolutely fascinating um, translation seminar, one of the best that I have ever attended with a book launch with both the translator and the author sharing their thoughts about the book and then also the fact that both of them go back a long way in their experience not only as translators like Nilofar is a translator um academic um creative writer and also a great organizer uh, organizer and administrator was I don't know how you manage all that yes fantastic Really, to be able to do that with so much seamlessly 
and without even uh, telling people that this is what I do. And so, and that modesty, I think, is absolutely one of the preconditions of a successful public intellectual. And uh, it's been fascinating also to be with Anis, where we meet at various forums, and his both his books are really teachable texts, as you must have realized, especially in comparative literature departments and also in translation workshops, because one can really refer to those books because they uh, cover a very wide spectrum. And now in the afternoon session, my duty is also as a timekeeper, but I don't think that is necessary anymore. And so I will start with by inviting Dr. Pragya Shukla, who incidentally was here from around 10 o'clock in the morning. And she has been so gracious and so unassuming, waiting for her turn. And so now, of course, you should really uh, drum the table and say, let's begin. So Dr. Pragya Shukla is former associate professor and head of the Department of Hindi at the Mani Ben Nanavati Women's College, Mumbai. She has served as a visiting PG Hindi professor at Sri M. D. Shah Manila, Mahila College, Mumbai, with 50 years of teaching experience so she scored half a century. She <laughs> has also established herself as a prominent figure in the field of research. She has conducted a major research project sponsored by the UGC and has presented numerous research and academic papers, both at national and international levels. Dr. Shukla has formerly worked as the research guide of Hindi at SNDT Women's University Spy. Additionally, she has participated in multiple national and international conferences and seminars, including the recent Vishwa Hindi Sammelan at Fiji, where she presented her paper. Her research works have been published in over 70 journals and books. She has also translated multiple books in Gujarati and Hindi. Presently, she's a member of the editorial board a quarterly magazine titled Vivek Kiran. Yeah, that's why the demand is Vivek Kiran. And with that, it's for you now. Dr. Pragya, the floor is all yours on the microphone. Thank you, Professor Sayyid Sanjukta. Uh, Professor Kindu Sayyid Professor Sridhar, and my friend, Hindukar, Professor Hindukar Barucha. First of all, I am thankful for Hindukar Barucha for inviting me for this uh, translation symposium and to present my views on Gujarati dimensions of the Gujarati and Hindi translation. Today, borders have been disappearing. With each day, bringing in new technologies in communication. This puts the world's literature and research at your fingertips. And consequently, translations have acquired a greater importance. Eminent Hindi scholar Golana Tiwari has rightly said that language was born through the interchange of ideas among people and the work of translation has made that interchange possible between different language speaking individuals. Human feelings are not dependent on any region or language. I recollect words of veteran Hindi film actress Sharmila Tagore that some feelings and reactions of movie going audience are so common. It happens in the same manner in all the theaters across the country. She was referring to the reaction of a large part of audience of her movie. When the story was taking a period jump and the character had to look older. However, a particular place or situation to affect intensity of its basic instincts, which, is, which in turn affect the inner mind. Since literature is expression of inner mind, 
places and situations become relevant in translations. The Vedic languages, the folk languages, and Sanskrit are prelude to ancient languages. An eminent Gujarati critic, Harivan Payani, said, Ancient Indian languages like Sanskrit, Prakrit, as well as modern Indian languages like Gujarati, Hindi, Marathi, Bengali are chronologically originated from Indo-Aryan language branches. In Hindi and Gujarati languages, majority of words are tatsam, meaning similar, and tadbhav, meaning derived from Sanskrit. In India's multilingual and multicultural backdrop, the importance of translation is multidimensional. During post-independence, a vast change was observed in the linguistic domain. Due to this, all Indian languages have undergone huge transformation. Hindi is not only an official language, but also a deep language as per Indian Constitution. Article 343.1 of the Constitution states that the official language of the Union shall be Hindi in Devanagari script. But Article 351 goes still further and states that it shall be the duty of the Union to promote the spread of the Hindi language so that it may serve as a medium of expression for the composite culture of India and to secure its enrichment by assimilating without interfering with other languages of India. Hindi is the most spoken language in the country. Nearly 44% of the total population of India speaks Hindi. In addition, it is a second language of language for more than 11% population. Thus, almost 55% of Indians speak Hindi. Globally, Hindi language is spoken in more than 20 countries apart from India. In comparison to Hindi-speaking population of India, just 6% of Indian population speaks Gujarati. Considering this, Translation of Gujarati words into Hindi assumes more significance for sharing of social, cultural, and educational aspects. In her translation of Gitanjali Shri's Hindi novel, Daisy Rockwell has rightly said that in, in India, there is definitely a growing interest in translations and a growing respect for non-English people language literature. Requirements and responsibilities of translations depend on the nature of the work being translated, whether it is literary work, non-fiction book, article, information booklet, or technical text. Translating a literary work comes with an immense responsibility. Emotions and meanings conveyed by the writer in the original work make translation even more crucial and critical. Translation always poses challenges, not only in terms of the text, but also in terms of culture, linguistic, stylistic, semantic, and socio-cultural issues. Each language has its own concepts, different linguistic, grammatical, semantic, and phonetic labels, and peculiar connotations and denotations in a specific culture or society. Each language is rooted in the culture of the region where it is spoken and expresses its typical cultural attributes. In this way, each language carries a different culture and this makes the process of translation more complex. A simple and natural expression in the original text, if translated verbatim, may appear artificial or strained 
or even unintelligible in the translated version. This accordingly requires inevitable changes in the process of translation, specifically in the areas of grammar and content. To take care of these aspects, translators must understand the nuances of both languages and culture. One has to ensure that the translated version retains and conveys the very meaning of the original as clearly as possible. During pre-independence and post-independence era, a very few literary translations of Gujarati literature were available. But after 1980s, many literary translations took place. There are various factors which affected, affected this change. Translation has become a major discipline which is being taught at university level. Translated books of Indian languages other than Hindi and comparative studies in literature have been included in the syllabus. Many scholars and writers took initiative in, this, in the area of translations. Various government, non-government, and private institutions such as Sahitya Akademi, Gujarat Vidyapit, Gujarati, Gujarat Sahitya Akademi, National Book Trust, started taking interest in translation work and encouraged it by giving awards. Recently, Bank of Baroda established Bank of Baroda Rashtrabhasha Samman with a view to promoting availability of regional literature of the India to the general public in Hindi. When the Gujarati writer Dinka Joshi initiated Gujarati Sahitya Pradhan Pratishtan and published Hindi translations of books authored by eminent Gujarati writers. Famous Hindi writer Ramanika Gupta started Ramanika Gupta Foundation under the aegis of, of which she published Artiya Dalit Sahitya Katakosh Gujarati and Hashiye Unangati Aurat Gujarati short stories on women's liberation movement. Unfortunately, both these foundations do not exist now. Dr. Yogendra Pratap Singh, director, Ayodhya Shodh Sansthan, has published a book on Gujarati Ram Katha in Hindi, which is edited by Dr. Tribhu and Rai under the project Ram Katha in Indian Languages. I am thankful to all those writers who gave me an opportunity to translate their work, which included short stories, articles, novels, essays, and biographies. My interest in translation originated during my doctoral research entitled Consciousness of Women in Women Novelists of Hindi and Gujarati, a Comparative Study, followed by UGC major research project on comparative study of Hindi and Gujarati novelists. Many years ago, an editor of Hindi magazine, Pragati Shil Akalp, gave me a small writer written by Professor Sitan Shubhai Mehta titled Upper Deep Power in Gujarati for translation in Hindi. The meaning of the title written in Pali language is be a light unto yourself. These were the last words of Gautam Buddha. That was the beginning of my translation journey from Gujarati to Hindi. Now, let us talk about the challenges of translation from Gujarati to Hindi and how the translator resolves them. Both Gujarati and Hindi have same roots and have evolved primarily from Sanskrit. Gujarati literature, through the process of its evolution, has achieved an enhanced level of expression, which sometimes makes it difficult to convey in Hindi. This is more so because over the years, years 
Hindi itself has been influenced by other languages and is used by people whose culture is different from Gujarati. Gujarati is the language of Gujarat, but it is spoken with different and peculiar variations in different regions or zones like Kathiawadi in Saurashtra, Kachi in Kach, Charotari in Central Gujarat, and Surti in South Gujarat. Tribal areas have their own dialects, so translators who are familiar with these regions are in position to do justice to these translations. I would like to share one example of a phrase which is commonly used in Saurashtra and culture. Instead of saying the person is no more or dead, they say pacha khaya, meaning gone back. This must have originated from the philosophy that the soul goes back to its original place. Similarly, it is very challenging to translate Gujarati Dalit dialects as it is greatly influenced by lifestyles and local culture of tribal areas. Various words, especially abuses, phrases, and idioms do not find place even in standard dictionaries. Compared to contemporary literature, it becomes quite challenging to translate books published in pre-independence or early post-independence period, as some words used at that time in social life, religious ceremonies, or that but cultural backdrop are no longer in use now. I have faced these challenges while translating a couple of novels of that era, like Harelo Agni, Pent Up Fire, which is based on the revolt of 1857 and published in the year 1935, and Amas Natara, Stars of New Moon, Reminiscences of Kishan Singh Chawla, published in the year 1953. At times, I use multiple dictionaries to translate indigenous Gujarati words, phrases, proverbs, etc., and search for their Hindi equivalents. Translation of poetry poses its own challenge, and I do consult Hindi scholars and Gujarati writers. Translating Mr. Dinka Joshi's biographical novel on Leo Tolstoy, Gai Kal Vinani Auti Khan, meaning future without past, was a challenge in itself as it depicts the cultural background of 19th century Russia. It took me some time to set my mind in that period and culture. It was the same predicament during translation of novel Shapita, meaning accursed, which depicts the character of Kaike, the well-known character of Ramayana, but from her point, own point of view. Names of the trees, plants, birds, animals, Vegetables, fruits, dishes, sweets, kitchen tools are difficult to translate, but quite often I keep certain words which are commonly used in relevant culture and language in their own original form. In Leo Tolstoy's novel, there is a drink called Sweeten, which I retain in the translation after consulting the author. In Medha Trivedi's novel, Sutri, Trede, names of two sweets are mentioned, Mysorpa and Hari. Both are so famous locally and in Gujarat, so I retain them and explain them in the bracket. There are three genders in Gujarati, masculine, feminine, and neutral. But Hindi has only first two genders, so the translator has to take utmost care in translating words falling in neutral gender in Gujarati. For example, milk, curd, cartoon, 
nose have neutral gender in Gujarati. But except nose, which is feminine in Hindi, other words are masculine. Till a few years back, work of translation was considered just a hobby. Translator's name rarely appeared on the book. It may find its place just somewhere in the corner. Booker Prize winner translator Daisy Rockwell's view in this context is very appropriate. The work of translation is considered as a hobby, an amateurish work, which is to be done in free time. They don't consider it as a scholarly work. But times have changed, and translation is being recognized as scholarly work, with due credits being given to the translators. This perhaps happened to many professions in the past. As famous fashion designer Mani Rabadi once said while receiving an award for a film that designers were simply treated as Darji. Now, a few words on the review or the criticism of translations in Hindi. In Hindi, translations have so far have not been considered worthy of a mention or review. Dr. Suryanarayan Ratsube, an eminent scholar, critic, translator, and writer of Hindi and Marathi literature, in his book, Sociology of Translation, has devoted one chapter on this topic, but has concluded that there is no criticism of translation of Hindi in this country. Unfortunately, it has not even started. Reviews are written on the translations, but basically, they are review of the book and not the quality of translation. Ideally, there must be check on quality of translation by way of review. Thus, to enhance the quality of the translation, it's high time to keep check on the translated work. To sum up, translation of Indian languages in Hindi can play a much wider role in integrating literary and cultural heritage of India by reach, reaching out to most of the population. Thanks for the patient hearing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pragya. That was a very rich, well-structured paper. And I'm sure there will be a number of questions here because uh, many of you know Gujarati very well. And here she's been translating one Indian language into another. So maybe can we welcome a few questions for Professor Pragya Shukla. I have told everything about my translation. You have done fabulous works. There are lots of has been done that I think everybody is too scared to even ask in there. Any questions? What about the young scholars out there? From the morning you've been listening about translation, now do you want to become translators? <laughs> Actually, if I might say this, Pramya wanted to present a paper in Hindi, but I mm -hmm. said to her that if you speak in English, then we mean more people would understand the English than Hindi, but maybe I was unfair to what she should have, because that's what I spoke in Hindi as well, so. Yeah. Yeah. Hindi is fine, but English is the international link language. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Hindi is the national link language. Yeah. Yeah. Point. Yeah. Yeah. Let's look at the map and you know. Yeah. 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 So, that is what I And here. And amongst us, there is a translator and a poet. She handles many languages, and uh, that's Parvita, who just stepped in. And she translates from Bangla to English. 
And he can also translate from English to Bangla. You know, that is something that many people generally avoid. Because um, you can. I think you are the power translator. You are the power translator. But like my Bangla is not so good. And so um, when I translate, I do not translate back from English to Bangla. As a matter of fact, my, I write my poetry in English. And once only I took one poem to Navanita Devsen, and it was called the mark, which means mad. And she said something better than me. Which Yeah. So you must have a lot of questions. <laughs> so uh, these you have translated so many books. You know, are some of them taught in uh, universities or colleges or in schools in terms of uh, or, no, not yet, but they will be. So I'm sure there will be a, a lot of curiosity about this uh, translation, both a, from Gujarati to Hindi and Hindi to Gujarati. This is a two-way cross fertilization, which is the best thing that can happen. And maybe sometimes you can also think of translating from Gujarati to English because that opens it up even further. I'm sure okay. you're okay. You are looking up your paper the bar. Yeah. Thanks to the Thanks to the So so this has been an enjoyable uh, presentation. Any uh, questions for her? And so she, you are a native user of the Gujarati language. Yes. And you have also a professor of Hindi. A professor of Hindi and she translates with equal confidence from Gujarati to Hindi and vice versa, which is really fabulous. And they, this particular, uh, Seminar has been a learning experience, but because we had a Tamilian who uh, reads Urdu, translates from Urdu into French. This was fantastic. In your case, it's Gujarati and then Hindi. And there is no, I mean, who would say that Gujarati and Hindi are similar in terms of uh, even the use of language, in the use of uh, even alphabets or whatever. So it's been. Uh, Wonderful experience and one question from you. Since morning you are sitting like sitting uh, like the listeners in the evening. Yes. Maybe yeah. we'll wait till the end yeah. of the session. Okay. Hindi ka Gujarati mein translate. Manabhi Vaidyanath. Anyway, yeah. Manavar, Vaidya, 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 from yeah. Hindi to Gujarati or from yeah. any language? Any, so, any language. So, a psychological novel, what exactly do you mean? By psychological novel, which are the authors you have in your mind? Jainendra, Ilachandra Joshi. Hindi, Hindi, Jainendra. I don't the next paper is oh, only yeah. the prior to that uh, just one question that suddenly occurred to me you referred to Tolstoy. 
Now, the original uh, translation that was made into Gujarat. Hello, everybody. Please allow me to very briefly thank Professors Nilufer Barucha and Klaus Stierstorfer, co-directors of the Mumbai Münster Institute of Advanced Studies and co-hosts of this launch event, for having invited me to share my thoughts on a modest and limited interest in translation studies, and Professor Sridhara Jaswaran for chairing this session uh, masterfully, as always. Of course, many thanks to the author, Dalpat Chauhan, uh, Chief Guest, uh, Padma Shri Professor Sitanshu Ishsan Chandra, the other speakers, and all of you for being here. Also, apologies for not being able to deliver my keynote speech in person, and my gratitude to Ms. Kertiris but for helping me with this recording. When a colleague of mine told me a few days ago she did not want to pursue her PhD research topic of literary translations, as she could see no future for them, what with um, artificial intelligence and chat GPT and even Google Translate, I was somewhat surprised. And then I set out to think about the topic, especially in the context of this keynote speech. Is there no future for human-created literary translations, as my colleague seems to believe? Perhaps in the case of specialized translations, such as the technological or the economics field, or the legal one, although there is a cultural factor in those as well, still needing human mediation, such as the differences between the Anglo-Saxon and the continental judicial systems for the latter, for example. But surely, not yet in the case of literature. The regional vocabulary and grammar constructions, the registers and variants, the choices one has to make, surely cannot, at least not for the time being, be dealt with by a machine. A quick Google search did not put my mind at rest, as it looks that what is preached at the moment is simply a collaboration between human and machine while the letter is getting more and more sophisticated every second. 
For example, we are told in an article written in uh, 2020 by Alana Cullen and posted on the Indian page of the Goethe Institute that, I quote, when Google Translate was first launched in 2006, it could only translate two languages. By 2016, it was supporting over 103 languages and translating over 100 billion words a day. Now, that is in 2020, the time of writing the article, not only does it translate, but it can also transcribe eight of the most widely spoken languages in real time." Unquote. However, if we apply translation theories on the products of AI, which do we encounter? For the moment, we keep wondering with Peter Constantine, I quote, what will the machine be mimicking? Is it going to do some beautiful and brilliant foreignization? Or is it going to do an amazing domestication? Or is it going to make Chekhov sound like he was writing 10 minutes ago in London? As he said in 2019, he was of course referring to the two translation strategies regarding the closeness of the target text to the source text as developed by Lawrence Venuti in 1995. For indeed, the theories so far at the basis of traductology and translation studies as academic subjects in universities could lose their relevance in the face of the developments of AI. And not only because of AI and translation machines, but also because of the way the world has changed with globalization, decoloniality, post-communism, crisis in ecology, pandemics, etc., happening as we speak. And translation studies needing to follow these changes closely. As Susan Paisnet and Harish Trivedi were pointing out in their 1999 volume, Postcolonial Translation Theory and Practice, regarding the postcolonial translation, I quote, in current theoretical discourse then, to speak of postcolonial translation is little short of a tautology. In our age of the valorization of migrancy, exile and diaspora, the word translation seems to have come full circle and reverted from its figurative literary meaning of locational disruption. Translation itself seems to have been translated back to its origins." Unquote. Are we departing from Homi Baba's third space of hybridity, subversion, and even the liminal space of blasphemy of the cultural translation, where post-colonial migrants of minority cultures can claim some agency within the majority culture? Not yet, I suppose, as his text, How Newness Enters the World, Postmodern Space, Postcolonial Times and the Trials of Cultural Translation in the Location of Culture, although first published in 1994, continues to be highly influential and can be applied not only on postcolonial theory, but also on the post-communist one. If one regards Europe as the original and the colonies as copies, or its translations, uh, which they were supposed to duplicate, as Basnat and Trivedi were uh, proposing at page four of the above mentioned volume, and one eliminates one part of Europe, Central and Eastern, the post-communist countries, and uh, assimilates this part of Europe with the former colonies, one can easily see the similitude. To underline the power dimension of translations, Basnat and Trivedi mention in their introduction Sir William Jones and his uh, 1789 English translation of the Sanskrit romantic play um, Abhigyan Shah Kuntalam under the name of Sakantala or the Fatal Ring, an Indian drama. In it, he fell prey to his own cultural bias when he chose not to describe the heroine as breaking sweat as in the original, the action takes place in Calcutta, as this was not considered appropriate in England, where one sweats only when one is, I quote, hot, ill, afraid, or working very hard, according to Collins in 1987. Whereas in India, it is a sign of sexual interest and arousal. This can be interpreted as Victorian censorship, a temptation to erase what is culturally specific, the second example of the British dominance in India evoked in the same introduction is represented by several translations into Hindi of the Rubieto uh, of Omar Khayyam, 
done in the 1920s and 1930s via the medium of English, while Persian had been the elite court language of India before English took its place, so direct translations would have been very handy. This is what the authors call, I quote, an instance of Orientalism translated, and perhaps even a foreshadow, so to say, of the empire translating back, unquote. So, translation is a political act, as Bivak announced in the chapter, The Politics of Translation, in Outside in the Teaching Machine in 1993, as well as an act of love, as, I quote, the task of the translator is to facilitate this love between the original and its shadow, a love that permits fraying, holds the agency of the translator and the demands of her imagined or actual audience at bay. Unquote. And the translator must know both languages and the context of both languages to be able to engage in a satisfactory way to the text and the translated version. More so for the feminist translator, as her task is, quote, to consider language as a clue to the workings of gendered agency, unquote, which can, of course, be different from the task of the writer, even if she's a feminist writer writing herself within a different history, imperial, patriarchal, and racist. The political perspective of translations is raised, together with a traductological one and the philosophically cultural one of its universalism, translation as deconstruction, by Bogdan Giu, Romanian poet, essayist, and literature translator, with over 60 books of translations published so far. He explores what he calls the, quote unquote, Eastern condition of the translator between superpowers where they can only translate, again I quote, as a duty and as a technique as well, as a survival art, as existential technique, as virtue, as historical performance, and as excellence, unquote. Giwa seems to recreate Homi Baba's in-between space when he mentions the power of the translator of placing himself or herself, quote unquote, neither in the Orient nor in the Occident, to continuously translate versions and versions of the norms that is not counter norms, but poor insignificant game margins. In a relevant play upon words in Romanian, traducem, translating, mean, meaning taking a cross, he deconstructs the concept of translation as betrayal from the famous Italian saying traduttore traditore, translator, uh, uh, traitor, which should be, according to him, reinterpreted through, I quote, a new, updated and universal Eastern political theory as translation is the act of bringing strangers home, which means betraying the local culture and demeaning one's maternal language. So what is the role of the author as translator within the two cultures? Let us have a look at the example of a cultural translator offered by um, John Balahiri, also presented in Trivedi's chapter in Translation, Reflections, Refractions, Transformations of Paul Saint-Pierre and Prafula Sika um, volume in 2007 as I translate, therefore I am, as Lahiri said. She echoes Baba's definition that I quote, translation is the performative nature of cultural communication. It is language in actu, enunciation, positionality, rather than language in situ, enonce or propositionality. Here is what Lahiri said, uh, quote, translation is not only a finite linguistic act, but an ongoing cultural one. Unquote. In the case of communist Romania, it is interesting to note the censorship applied in between um, 1944 and 1989, described in the volume Control of Books, Censorship of Literature in the Communist Regime in Romania, authored by Liliana Korobka and published in um, 2014. Control was the word chosen by the communist authorities to stand for censorship, a complex mechanism of subordination and supervision which stifled free speech and the free circulation of ideas. 
all cultural aspects, Romanian and foreign, were subordinated to the ideology of the Romanian Communist Party, and therefore translations from literature, philosophy, social sciences, etc., be they under the form of articles or books, were submitted to strict controls and had to undergo a clear approval chain. The topics and language to which censorship was applied were political, social, religious, erotic, sexual, or anything conceived as distantly controversial. Perhaps the best known Romanian translator is a woman, Antoinette Aralian, born in 1924 in a small town family of the local Jewish bourgeoisie who lived through the Second World War and the Holocaust and the communist and post-communist years to 2015. Her career extends over 60 years and 125 translated books published mostly from English, but also from Italian and French, of poetry, prose, theatre, including Henry Miller, James Joyce, from the Indian literary space, just uh, to name just a few, Anita Desai's Cry the Peacock in 1966, or Salman Rushdie's The Ground Beneath Her Feet, published in 2003 in Romanian translation. As a young graduate in the full Stalinist years, she was hired through a family friend in a job of censor. She recalls this in a collective volume published in uh, 2011. Her job was to take away from public libraries all the idealist philosophers, the books with topics which could be interpreted as anti-socialist, pro-capitalist, pro-imperialist, mystical, erotic, or subversive of the regime in any way. As she got letters K, L, M, and N at one point, she took away Kant, Kafka, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, D. H. Lawrence, and Henry Miller. She translated these last two authors in a strange turn of fate 50 years later and kept Malraux. During communist times, she also suffered from censorship as a translator not so much in the choice of books to be translated, but in whole excerpts which needed to be combed before seeing the light of day. Nevertheless, she was able to avoid censorship most of the times based on her previous experience in a controlling and censorship communist institution. By the way, when asked which was the most difficult book to translate, she named Rushdie's The Ground Beneath Her Feet, quote unquote, a colossal book with so many levels and the most challenging author, Henry Miller, the trying spot of my career, again, quote unquote. In her opinions on translating and translation, Antoinette Aralian asserts her divided loyalty between the readers and the author, with whom she tries to identify, which is easier if she likes them, but difficult when there is total incompatibility between them, as in the case of Henry Miller. This is indeed very close to the ideas Lawrence Venuti had. I quote from Lawrence Venuti, the translator works better when he and the author are simpatico, said my friend. And by this, he meant not just agreeable or congenial, meanings which uh, this Italian word is often used to signify, but also possessing an underlying sympathy. The translator should not merely get along with the author, not merely find them likable, there should also be an identity between them." Unquote. A very quick note at this point about Ralian's initial hesitations vis-a-vis -vis Henry Miller's texts, full of erotic imagery and very clear sexual language, as we know, which she blames on the putibondere of her interwar small-town bourgeois education, as well as the many years in which, as a censor in communist times, she slashed full excerpts of any erotic connotations from English language literature in translation into Romanian. For her, translation cannot be theorized. She claims she could never teach it as an academic subject, as it is, quote unquote, a mystery done by someone with a special gift or escapism or a panacea or like puzzle solving. Moreover, Ralian seems to be closer to the idea of domestication in translation, 
which she assimilates with recreation and recreation, while original literature is procreation. While she claims that the aim of a good translation is to create, I quote, a duplicate which would seem unique, so that when you read it, not to have the impression it is something transplanted from another language, as the original must be followed closely, unquote. Preparing for this keynote speech, I informally interviewed a good friend and colleague of mine, Magdalena Chubankan, translator from Japanese of nine novels so far, and English of four novels, into Romanian. Of course, she's also a very expert and knowledgeable Japanese and English language instructor and cultural studies facilitator. I wanted to know how she proceeds in her work when encountering a difficult to translate cultural concept and found out she chooses to either paraphrase in the text or, and this is her preferred choice, as it also means educating the readers, as she put it, add a reference note. However, it is interesting to note the publishers do not accept footnotes or endnotes easily, as they regard those as intrusions in the original text, thus also favoring a domesticating approach. Magdalena also talked of some degree of censorship in post-communist times. Now a sort of self-censorship or publisher's censorship in the choice of texts to translate and in the way they are tackled based on what they call, quote unquote, the ordinary Romanian readership without ever defining this term. In the end, just to summarize these reflections, the role of the human literary translator continues to be relevant nowadays, and we deem it as irrepra irreplaceable in a context of the appearance and development of translating machines, software, and AI, which can only support, not stand, for the human brain, compassion, knowledge, and ultimately love, all necessary ingredients of a good translation. Knowing Nilofer Barucha as a person and a professional, I have no doubt in my mind her English translation under the title Homeland of the Gujarati novel Malak by Dalpat Chauhan, which we are here to launch today, is a perfect example of this. Thank you. She's not there, she's not able to come online. If you're having problems with internet or around the world, except so, for solar surges, I don't know. If we discuss it, you know, let's talk about it because she so, made some interesting points. Yes, uh, Roxana, Elizabeth, Marinus, let's go. Can this be recorded? Can this be recorded? Yeah, yeah, let's record it. So, Professor Roxana introduced. Um, a particular aspect which is very alarming and which was not referred to uh, in the earlier sessions and I'm so glad she brought it up and it is about the threat of artificial intelligence and chat GPT and how these may even supersede all human efforts and human translators will be uh, uh, replaced by machine translators. However, that I think from my general understanding, and that is a very limited understanding, translating uh, textbooks into any language can be trusted with a machine translation, translator or machine translation. But to, for a machine translation of a literary text will be very, very tough because the machine is programmed in a particular way. The machine is not like the human brain, which is unreliable, but at the same time, the limitless capacity of the human brain is something I don't think at this stage can really outsmart. Now, smart is intelligence, sir. Yes, can really outsmart the human brain, at least at this point of time. Yes, and therefore, 
to say that, well, human uh, translators are a thing of the past. I don't know. There are very really young people out here who are familiar with chat GPT and you are hoping that they don't have to come to the university anymore. Chat GPT will do the work. If you have to just outsource it and answer come and you just submit it and then it's your degree at the drop of a drop of a hand. Yes. So yes, we want that sort of fast progress happening. There is no way of reversing evolution. Yes. And there is no way in reversing what STEM is all about, as you know, everybody's talking about science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and anything to do with humanities and social sciences is looked upon as, oh, also that. Yes. So we are looking at a paradigm shift, really, in terms of what knowledge is all about. And there, of course, the intrusion of artificial intelligence is, and especially in the West, here it's not going to be so easy because 70% of our people don't even know how to handle a, tech, uh, a laptop. A mobile phone is not a laptop. Yes. And to say that, okay, I can write short stories on the mobile is really a way of uh, sort of a compensatory way of saying that, well, I can do it also on this device. Right at this moment, as far as my limited knowledge goes, the lap laptop is not available in India to 70% to of our population. So we are looking at a niche group, and mostly a niche group with uh, English speaking. Mostly. Yes. So in terms of the machine translation, the fears of machine translation, I do not think it is going to come in a hurry in our country. And the uh, rest of her presentation, where she was, of course, uh, referring to mobility and also to um, the way in which we cannibalize and uh, also domesticize the use of tra translation, whether it is foreignization or whether it is cannibalization, and she used the word traitor, which is one of the most famous um, uh, definitions of translation, that is the unreliability of translation, which is why in the morning also we heard from most of the uh, presenters talking about uh, translation as not being definitive. You cannot say that if I translate one book and I say that this cannot be translated any further because nobody can do better than this, that is not possible because in the human mind, there's a new to go there. Yes. And the way our human mind interprets an uh, original text is also the mind's response, uh, which is recorded in the translation. And if you have a particular ideology, as you noticed that. The communists of that 1945 to 1989 uh, period were a sort of a censor board. But the censor board is not only the Duma or the communist parties. Yes, the censor board is also the publication houses. And the publication houses also would tell you what to write because, not because they're afraid of the regime or because they are going to uh, sort of think in terms of establishment. The publication houses have another agenda, that is saleability and marketability. Yes, all these factors into a translation or even an original text. Jhupalayani wrote in, uh, wrote about Bengal and the books were very well received. When she went to Italy and wrote the Italian novel, it was not well received. It may have been brilliant, but the deception, however, he recognized her using of another European language as creative, as the tool of creationism. So I think I have said enough. <laughs> Professors, you know, they always call us progressive because we are constantly progressing without being able to put anything. <laughs> yes. So I will stop now. And if there is any more intervention, we can have that. Ma'am, I have one query. I mean, on the search database, Ma'am, you use the mic, please. On the search database, 
Singer web of time and social. Chat GPT has been means for presented as co author. So, in future, if we use artificial intelligence for translation, whether it's fiction or non fiction, so chat GPT or artificial intelligence, any app will be means presented as translator. There is yeah, that is the fear she was talking about. Yes, mm -hmm. that. But why artificial intelligence threatening human mm -hmm. translators? Whether that is feasible in 2023, we don't know. In 2015, what will happen? We don't know. We don't know. Mm -hmm. Yes, maybe human uh, the human intelligence will eliminate art. Or the other way around. Because the reliability of artificial intelligence and the unreliability of human intelligence can lead to immense possibilities. This is my humble understanding. I don't understand a heap of technology. If I go to switch on something, I don't know it becomes so adamant that it will not switch it to itself. <laughs> so, so for, for me to even make these remarks, my son is into Nokia and all that. He would say, oh, How embarrassing you are. I'm so glad I got it. <laughs> yes. So, yes, therefore, this is my own understanding because, in terms of creativity, how much of a programmed uh, bunch of microchips or whatever these are made of are going to substitute creative intelligence is something I'm, I don't know because artificial intelligence does not have your. Emotional intelligence, creative intelligence, creative freedom to make break free from any program that is the human mind. Yes. And I am not sure whether that can be done, but definitely for in terms of studies, in terms of doing your homework, chat <laughs> GPT is very something that the reliability of chat GPT is being absolutely celebrated throughout the world and even better in the world. Yeah. I think it is banned in Sweden recently that ChatGPT will not be allowed because you know that is a way of discouraging students from studying and there is no substitute in, in terms of not studying and acquiring from some other source. Whether that will lead to a development of your brain or trouble or not, I do not know. And I can, yes, it's something I loved when she said that there should be mutual respect between the translators, like the original author and the translator. Somewhat what you are saying, the human emotion comes into play, and only with mutual respect, the symbiotic relationship can a good translation be made. So that was a very important thing she said. Any other? Uh, Professor, she always goes to the No wonder can't keep it. Okay, so uh, does research ever get translated? Not the old man, other people's, does that get translated? I'm asking. Um, the research papers. Because I'm sure they're yeah. translated. Does that get translated? She means to say, in many translations. Uh, no, you mean. Uh, no, no. Like, does I mean, human translate the human uh, research paper? Uh, she mean to say, yeah, it, it, depends depends on, it depends on your, on the purpose. Of, if you take somebody's research paper, it's written in Gujarati, and then you are translating that into Hindi. That's what you mean. Yeah. If, if you're translating into Hindi, what is your intention? Whether will you be able to read it Better if it is in Hindi or is it about plagiarism? Uh, what I'm asking, for example, uh, if I am uh, reading a research paper of a psychology, right? So, in that, I can't translate book, like the way you said you, you guys translate the thing. In that, you always translate it in a way of mirror, okay? You translate it in a same beautiful manner, but uh, changing it to left to right to right to left. But I uh, mean, the things are same. But when it comes to research paper, you just can't, you know, translate, you just can't uh, play with the words. Okay. So what I'm asking is if a person translates a research paper, does 
scan that person, change the word because no, their words are really uh, what you're talking about is textbook translation or research paper translation, yeah. which is absolutely nothing to do with literary translation. Uh -huh. Literary mm -hmm. translation is also to read between the lines. It is not only the lines, but in textbook translation, if you try to make those interventions which are creative. It will be a disaster for the students mm -hmm. as well as for the publisher and for yourself because people will identify you as the one who is contributing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, so it is an impossibility. Textbook translation has a word for word literal translation. So there is a uh, chat, uh, chat video. Yeah. I think chat GPT will be a good uh, instead of wasting so much of time. So, yeah. Yeah. If you're very well paid, then you can do textbook translation. Yeah. Otherwise, do the chat. <laughs> yeah. uh, Professor Shridhar has a lot to say. I can see. No, oh, I don't open my mouth. Come on, dear lady. I lost too many friends. <laughs> Actually, speaking about self censorship. Uh, with literary translations, um, with uh, Dalpan Bhai's book, uh, I've translated other Gujarati texts, but with Dalpan Bhai's book, there are these lots of different types of abuses. And uh, I just wonder what the publisher would make of it, because whether they would censor it, I said, no, whether they censor it or not. I'm going to, I mean, I didn't really have uh, uh, I mean, I translated it into English abuses, you know, and uh, uh, I I think the Sahitya Academy hasn't interfered with it. So they have gone into the text, and I was happy that all the abuses are there. Whatever I put in are there. I mean, Dalpaji was very creative. I mean, his, uh, his range of abuses was wonderful, but I had only a limited range. So I used that very in a rather frightened way, sort of putting dots and dashes and things like that. And it was scary. It, it does, but you know, I didn't I didn't want to use the F word and things yeah. like that, you know, which would catch somebody's eye immediately. So I said, no, 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 don't provoke anyone. Like experience. Yeah, just experience. <laughs> There's no particular question. I'm fortunate that we couldn't get Professor Edi, yeah. our only paper, we couldn't, uh, the recording, we couldn't play. And no, I think it's rather late, and we are going to invite him to do a one off uh, talk by himself later when he's actually coming online or he wants to come to Mumbai and present the talk. We'll be very happy to host him, but I think not today. So, so if there are with the, the interventions, questions for the paper, for both the papers, Professor Shuka is here waiting to respond to whatever <laughs> queries that are coming to mind and with this new intervention of missions now. Yes. Very soon you will have all robots in your way. Yes. <laughs> They won't have to sit here. They will be there somewhere. Yeah. Uh, if we have, uh, sorry, to run. Yes, please. Thank you. So anyway, you went to teaching literature to participate in a Hindi uh, global visual. We are curious. What kind of Hindi did you find in Fiji? And uh, what were the things they were interested in? Uh, many people speaking Hindi, with us also, driver and uh, what's in people, rest of the What was it, the dialect? No, our standard. They have their own language. But with us, they were talking, but they were communicating in Hindi. The Hindi speaking people in Fiji, the language was carried. Yes. So, was it an empty language 
for delete can you get it? So new generation doesn't uh, earlier generation yeah. you must you might have gone to the library school for but I'm curious when one language travels from one place to another, yeah. what does it carry with you? And did you don't get really interesting? Because they uh, they took the Rama and the Ramayana and Ram Chirit Manas and all those books and their forefathers were uh, yeah. reading that because they were bonded with us. Also, what literature was carried and see your idea of resonance in the, to my mind is a central idea of translation works. Is the resonance in one language and it will be text, is it carried to another? For example, I have studied quite extensively abuses in the uh, text and in your text. Uh, evidently, the abuses of the people who are tortured and you know, they, they are, but they are also routine. Yeah. For example, when you said your, your, it's just a way of saying, uh, like in South Korea, you would say Sala, Sala, and even more. I've seen also. Sorry, I don't know. Sorry, I didn't need it. But what I like the most in your text is that it carries sometimes the pain, sometimes the anger, sometimes the frustration. So these were the three things that the advice abusive words carried with them. That's why I'm saying what does the language carry? It is abusive, and you were able to use such. English kind of words, uh, hair and things like that, which, which carry these three things very distinctly. When his abuses were carrying pain, your English abuses were carrying pain. When his abuses were carrying anger, your English language abuses were carrying anger, and so on. That's why, uh, that's why. Machine translation, as you very rightly said, for scientific text in text without any emotive, you say it's okay. We should take away our words. We should, should do our work. Why not? <laughs> so, but uh, Abhida, Indiana, and Lakshana, Abhida, Lakshana, and Indiana, we should really go back to our linguistics. If you really want to try, it, it is Vyanjana, which is the most difficult. To carry from one language to another. This Lakshana also, which is a very different kind of Mukhart Vade, Tadjoge, Rodito, Prayojana, Lakshana. So, when one, for example, fat Devdat does not eat at day, during the day. So, when then, how, how is that? So, it is Ratri Bhojanam Devakshati. That means that he needs to ignite. So, such fun in such a lakshana. Uh, so, I think uh, your department should turn more and more towards uh, Indian politics, Indian linguistics, Indian uh, uh, history. Right. We, we are an interdisciplinary institute. So, we are open to all kinds of suggestions and open to different things. So. We are sociologists and people like that, not just uh, literature professors. But about PG, the Hindi they speak a lot of French Bhasha because a lot of them went from that side. And a lot of they they have recently been writing in English, a lot of the PGs, but uh, there are original what you call witness narratives of the actual uh, bonded laborers who were taken on the ships, even the first and second ship to Fiji. And there is a wonderful narrative by a man called Kotaram Sadhya, who has written something called Bhutlein Kitaka, which has also been translated into English as a haunted lights. And uh, since we are diaspora scholars, so we look at these things. And Vijay Mishra was speaking to us two months back on pre-recorded, wonderful, no problems. <laughs> <laughs>
and he came up with a keeper name also. We could hear him and everything, and there was something terribly wrong today. Very sorry about that. Vijay Mishra speaks a lot about that. And uh, his brother, Sudesh Mishra, is himself a poet who writes in English but also in British Bhakta. So we have that. And of course, in Mauritius, you have you know, the same kind of dialectal English. And as you said, they would speak standard English as well. Give us a paper on Hindi in different locations. Yeah. Hindi is something that we need some more papers along with this. <laughs> Can we, uh, if we are, I said, uh, Roxana was here twice uh, before she had been here for our seminars. This time we didn't have enough uh, funding for international affairs, would be for national affairs. Otherwise, we would have had an international uh, sort of participation as well. Never mind, fingers crossed. Next, next time, next time. Uh, so, if we are, uh, if we have no more questions, we can continue the discussion over tea and fingers crossed. We have all the problems <laughs> of the tea snacks, which are good with the tea. You want an eye tea. Uh -huh. So, uh, before that, of course, keep the uh, without Kirti, we couldn't have held any of this, and all of you have uh, been in touch with her, know that. So she is, yeah, so she is going to propose a vote of thanks. But be, be a proposal vote of thanks to her and speak. Right. Interns, men who are two interns, Jaguti and Shika. Let's go for the Kirti wouldn't have survived if uh, yeah. not for them. Uh, first, I really apologize for all the glitches that happened today. Uh, it was just out of control. I was not sorry for that. But I thank you all for your patience. And uh, when we were trying to sort it out, we started a little late. But thank you for your patience. I'd like to first and foremost start by thanking our chief guest who so kindly agreed come and be with us and talk to us. So uh, it was an enriching experience for me and I'm sure for everybody here. All of the speakers who have come from different parts of India uh, to be with us today. Uh, Professor Evan is in fact has to leave now to go back. He's, it's a very short trip but he made it here. Thank you. Thank you Professor Das Gupta. Thank you Dalbert Thani sir because uh, it was so good to meet all of you and be a part of this. Plus our uh, online participants, uh, speakers, sorry. Uh, thank you for joining us, Mr. Jerry Pinto. He managed to join us online today. Uh, Professor Oksana Marius, whose presentation we were able to create. Thank you. And once again, I apologize to Dr. E. Ramakrishnan for not being able to play his recording. But we will make it out. And our chair for the first session, Professor Schrieger, I don't see my out, but thank you. And the chairs for all the sessions, thank you. Professor Vidya, I think I will turn out uh, here to me. Uh, thank you to Shikha, who was a former intern, and I think even Jagruti is our former, but we are still moving on. To By just a week. By just a week. So uh, thank you to both of them. They've been a great help to me uh, for this symposium to get it all in shape. Our uh, junior researcher, Dr. Shamila Dejoria, who's come here today, she's always been with us on, at all our programs, and today she's come with us to this. Thank you. Thank you to all the guests who have come at short notice too. So uh, for that, we thank you. Uh, this Zoom couldn't have been set up without the technical assistance of our uh, university's department. So thank you to Mr. Lungu who sets it up for us. Mm -hmm. Although we have had some glitches again. 
<laughs> lunch, but we have the high tea here, which is in complete shape, if I may say so. <laughs> to Suhas from our canteen, to WRIC guest house, who has been kind enough to give us accommodation for all our outstation speakers, and to Mr. Shinde for uh, arranging the transport for uh, <laughs> this. And today he is the owner of the setup, but he's come himself because he's been too short of drivers. And uh, Mr. Sawan, in spite of his age, he's running around, he's doing a lot of things. I think he's also outside. So, yes, I thank you all, each and every one of you. I missed out on anybody. I apologize. Yeah. Professor Pragya, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. But uh, thank you, ma'am. We have been in touch only on WhatsApp today, was the day we yeah. went. So, yes, one of my oldest. I remember, ma'am, telling you about that. I'm really sorry to meet you, but once again, if I've missed out or taking anybody's name, uh, I thank them too. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Shall we risk going out? I'll just end the meeting.